This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning, good morning and welcome to this morning's Moonrise Safari. Just jokes, it's still the sunrise. It is lovely out here today in the Sabi Sand of South Africa. This game reserve is just so great. It's been bustling with all sorts of wonderful wildlife, especially hyenas. They've been calling all night long, and hopefully we'll be able to catch some of them in the act. My name is Taylor McCurdy, and on camera with me today is Ferg Clark. And welcome again to this live and interactive safari. If you'd like to ask us any questions or comments, hashtag safari live on Twitter, or you can talk to us via the YouTube chat. Right, let's get going. We are going to keep heading. Uh, Herbie has given me instructions this morning. Herbert um, is accompanying James on bushwalk, and uh, Herbert says he'd like to check the west. So we'll probably stick around in the area of where the bushwalk team will be, just in um, in case they do pick up on any tracks and we can move in fairly quickly. I know that Steve, who's also in the car today, he's out, uh, is going to head towards the east to see if he can't relocate on Tundi. So we've got that all happening down that way. So we'll check the opposite end. But first, we'll probably go... I think we'll probably go check the boundaries first. Maybe Fulhamon's cut line all the way down to Gary Main and then Triple M to see if anybody is crossed on over. Right, uh, Anna Marie, well done. You win bragging rights today for being the first person to put a comment through. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, you've stated that you are very excited for another cat today. Let's, let's keep our fingers crossed. We know Tundi, for some bizarre reason, doesn't seem to put. Many kills and trees. Let's hope she hoisted that Daker out of, uh, well, out of the way from those hyenas. Anyways, I did just see James. He was just behind us. Let's go and find out what his plans are. It's Wilder Day here on Bushwalk. <laughs> Hopefully we can make it cat a day. The herd has returned to quarantine clearings just outside the camp before the sun has come up. And they are currently in the processes of uh, well alarm calling at us because they're deeply surprised by the fact that we are still here with them. It is marvellous to have you with us today on Saturday. My name is James Henry. On camera today is Senzo Mkise. On a security detail, the inimitable Herbert Causa, not standing too far away from us. And our attempt is to go to the west and see what we can find there. With any luck, we'll find some tracks of a leopard, which would be very nice. Apparently, you can hear, you can hear or could hear. Oh, there is some sawing on the dam cam. Uh, I think we will tell Herbert that, and we will probably head down that way. Herberto! Okay, he says, which means thank you. I don't know what that means. We'll go and consult with him shortly. <laughs> he says we're going to go that way. We'll head down that way. <laughs> anyway, please talk to us. Hashtag Safari Live, of course, on Twitch Twitch. And then you can use the chat stream on YouTube, of course. Uh, Nina, you said you sound, it sounded like Tingana. I'm most impressed that you're able to hear the difference between the leopards. That said, I mean, I remember hearing Hukumuri call, and he's got a sort of, he isn't, he's got a, like a godfather voice, as I said before. It's very soft and intimidating, as Tingana's took over our northern boundary. So it's quite possible, Nina, that you are correct, that it is, in fact, Tingana that is calling. We'll head down there and do our level best to see what we can find. If it is Tingana, he's not wonderful on foot, but we'll keep you posted as we go. Be if they're still there, who knows? They might have moved off. She might have put up the tree. Hyena might have come and stolen it. Don't forget to jump and boy it. This is 100% live, 100% interactive. Drop us your questions and tweets. Don't be shy. Let us know how you're doing. Let us know what you'd like to see. It is nice and fresh this morning. It's a beautiful day, beautiful dawn. Hello, Dina. You'd like to see ground hornbills? Well, I would like to show you some. James heard some last night in the distance. So maybe we'll just materialize across some. 
That should be nice. They could be anywhere. They could be absolutely anywhere. They do move quite large distances in their search, never ending search for food. Have you seen one here, Seb? Ground hornbills. Seb's seen them. Yeah, so they do come and go, but um, I've yet to see any. I did hear some a couple mornings in the last few months, I've heard them. But their very loud call covers an enormous distance, so very hard to place where they might be. Jen, you would like to see lions and Fisa would like to see an aardvark. Well, okay, let's put that on the list, shall we? What we can do, and this is something that I always used to talk about with students, because when, stu when, when people train to become guides, um, whenever they go on activity, they are what we call special interests. And now those special interests are obviously what you as the viewer, you as the paying guest would like to see. So even if we don't find them, we can still focus on them. So let's see how we go. Ground hornbills, aardvark, and lions. Okay, we're going to weave those into the narrative this morning. And ideally, it would be good to find them. But if we don't find them. Okay, well, just reverse back here quickly. I think I saw something. There we go. Well. Well, there is not an aardvark, but although it does have big ears, like an aardvark, it looks like a herd of nyalas. And now, uh, Jen, nyalas have got this very nice camouflage, which helps them to blend in, and their strategy is to stand very still if lions happen to come past. And that is how they defend themselves against the prowling cats, is to stand very, very still. And not long ago, we saw the Torchwood Pride on Chitwa with a very big nyala bull which they thoroughly enjoyed. That is their strategy, to move along the ground and hide in a thick bush. Okay, well, it seems like Taylor's in a search for some cats. Let's go and see exactly where she's at. I'm just sitting at the moment. We're basically between Voyatella Dam and Voyatella Camp, waiting or whichever leopard was sawing a little bit earlier that you all heard on the dam cam, waiting for it to call again. But we've been sitting here for a good couple of minutes now and haven't heard anything. Ah, hi, Starling. That's nice of you to come and sit right next to us. I can hear alarming Franklins to the north of me. So I think I'm probably going to go across... Yes, okay, sorry Ferg, you know, I, let's do this everybody. I didn't hear the sawing, but I can see James now, which is good. So if James and Herbie and Senzel hear the sawing, they can let me know and point me in the right direction. I'm going to start responding to those alarming Franklins. Now, sometimes it can be quite difficult to pinpoint where a call is coming from. That's why we're going to use all our senses today. We're going to listen to what the bush has to say. So we'll just sneak across the dam wall. La, la, la. Check down in here too, because this is a favorite spot. We check everywhere, in fact. Okay. I also haven't seen any tracks just yet of any leopards. Not yet but we'll get there but i feel like being around camp at the moment is a it's a good spot there's a lot of game gathering around here when i use the word game in case you're wondering what are you talking about taylor what are you going to be playing today not that kind of a game game is a word we use to describe well variety of animals here in africa we'll see wait, wait over there and i think gallego pan nice clean drinking water as we we're chatting about on, uh, on bushwalk yesterday afternoon and between this pan it's a um, really really good spot at the moment see my fringe is not cooperating at the moment it won't stay underneath my hat and it keeps trying to blind me which may hinder me finding an animal today so if I don't find any cats it's because my hair is out of control just saying just putting that out there quickly now just so you all know and now if I don't check for tracks Herbie's gonna be very upset He'll tell me that I drove over them all, which is going to be a possibility. 
Okay. I just said to you now that James wasn't too far away. He's actually just down over there heading in this direction. Let's go and um, we'll see if he has heard any more of those rasping calls. We have heard nothing further, but we're walking slowly through the leopard-coloured grass here to see if the ears or head of Tingana don't pop out. Herbert reckons that Tingana has been in this block for the last few days on a kill. That's why he's been going north and south through the water, uh, but just north of Buffelshook and then over here. I think that's a fairly good theory. Uh, it is Herbert after all, and his theories are normally very correct indeed. Apart from the one about lightning laying eggs, that one I don't think is a very good theory at all. Oh my goodness, sorry about that everybody. It seems as though gremlins are starting early. I'll stop again. So we're now deciding if we're going to either go back towards Gallego Pan or if we're going to continue with Mbubu Road. So I'm just having a little listen. Can't hear any more alarming birds, and I still haven't seen any leopard tracks. Just trying to think. singana has been around here. We know he's been on a kill because he had a big belly. We followed his tracks. We did try to search for the kill yesterday, but we weren't successful. So he went north. Now I wonder. I, oh, I'd imagine that he would come back south again. I don't think he stayed. He doesn't stay in Bullsock for too long. Another one of th those virtual starlings running around. George, I, you know, I don't know why I didn't think of that. I have absolutely no idea why I didn't think to be a mouse. Let me try that. Let's see if this tactic is going to work. Virgo, you ready? Okay, we're going to have a tap. See, I've even got a tail. I've also got my kokoi on today. Are working. Have you seen the leopard yet? <laughs> what am I doing? Mice don't talk. I was going to be silent for the rest of the game draft now. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, George, that doesn't work. But thank you so much. Though. If anybody else has got any useful tips, I'm ready to try it all today. Hashtag Safari Alive. Please give me tips on how to find leopards because I have not seen one for a while. Okay. I think we're going to go this way. <laughs> Did I make a good mouse, Kristen? I wasn't going to reenact the bushwalk gerbils that I had, though. <laughs> I've had a lot of practice, you see, watching rodents. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Julie, I'm going on holiday soon. <laughs> Sunday morning. I'm going to Disneyland, says Ferg. Am I? Yeah. Did you buy me tickets to go to Disneyland? Yes! Berg bought me tickets to go to Disneyland. Which Disneyland? Uh, Disneyland, um, Cape Town. Disneyland Cape Town! <laughs> uh, I'm not going to Disneyland, although I'd really want to because I like roller coasters. Roller coasters are my thing. I've been going, or should I say, my dad has been sneaking me on roller coasters since I was four years old. It was the first time I ever went on one. He lied. I think he said, she's six or whatever. Like, you know, I, was, I was fairly tall growing up. I wasn't, I was, you know, I was not photos, middle to back. The kid and Bart grew me in high school. Um, Oh no, right. I'll tell you more about that in a, in a little bit. Off you go back to James. <clears throat> you guys are dead. You're on fire. 
Herbert was just talking to me about Taylor's reaction when we found when we found <laughs> Tandy yesterday. Apparently, I think she was she was on foot, wasn't she? And she went, ah, James is on fire. Um, that's not actually true at all. What happened yesterday when we found Tundi was we just got lucky, as 90% of the time when you find leopards, unless you're Herbert, is the case. Uh, we were driving past Biffle's Hook waterhole, and we heard the distress call of a diker, which I suppose was quite clear of us. I mean, Senzo and I, we both heard it, drove in. We did a bit of uh, investigation, heard some squirrels going crazy, carried on driving up. And then Senzo, for the second time in the day, spotted the leopard. So I really don't think that I was much on fire, so much as being warmed by the fire of others, which I'm very pleased to be doing. I don't mind that at all. <laughs> Let's have a look at the sunrise while we tell you what we're doing now. We've come to the northern side of the dam, and we are now moving towards basically where Taylor was, just to see if Tingana came from there and try and pick a direction from there. Captain Eltron, we are back onto the sawing of the leopards and how proficient they are at carpentry. Like I was saying, from the age of about five till about the age of 14, if they're very lucky, their carpentry skills are excellent. After that, uh, they seem to build less, do a lot less sawing, uh, and certainly before that, their carpentry skills are very poor indeed, and the, it takes about five years for them to learn to uh, sufficiently careful, Senzel. You're going to walk into this horrible tree. Uh, to care, <laughs> it takes about five years for them to learn effective carpentry. Thank you very much for that wonderful question. Something wrong with our bushwalk pack again? Let's go back across to Steve. We might have just found Tandy again. Just coming in very slowly. Seb can see them. Okay, they're on the other side of the bank there. They're having a little bit of a warm-up play. Let me just go a little bit further in. Just hold on for me for one second. There she is. Hello, beautiful mama. And salam. Good morning. Oh my goodness, sorry everybody, I'm trying, I can't even get my gloves on today. The doctors make it look so easy, so easy. All right, we'll carry on, we'll put them back on again. Border security, <laughs> folks says so does border security. Oh, Australian border security is my absolute favorite. Do you have any food in your bag? No, none, nothing. Open the bag, just food. <laughs> Wow, that's such a great show. If anyone hasn't watched Border Security Australia, best you get on it. It's so great. You can even watch the old episodes. It doesn't even matter. Okay, ready? You're going down. I think we're going to go all the way up Gauri, not Gauri Catlan. We will come down Gauri Catlan. But first, we will go up Gallagher. All the way to the boundary. Oh, look who I brought. I wonder if Christine from Hershey is watching. Because... Sam Morris, more. I've, re I've actually lost my mind. Like I'm not normal anymore. I do need to go on holiday. This is Maurice. For those of you that don't know, he is wearing a kokoi, and then that belt. I have to lift up his trunk. Boop. Fearless. And he's got a birthmark. I worked out that Maurice has a birthmark. That's not dirt. Haha. Uh -huh. So yes, I cut one of my shookers up, made this for him, and he now has a nice belt to go with it because he is fearless. Okay, go down, Maurice. And that is, I suppose I should have to tell you. So yesterday, I found out something, but I'm not going to tell you yet. I'll tell you just now. I'm going to send you to Steve Orvo, who has managed to relocate on the Queen Tandy. Yes, well, we have. We found her, and Talumba is here as well. 
And um, sorry about the the leaves in the way, but if we a metre further forward, we seem to have no signal. The gremlins seem to be on very heavily attacking mode this morning. <laughs> it's so crazy. There's a there's a Franklin in between Tundi and Tlalumba. Tlalumba is just on the side there. She's uh, enjoying rolling with a bit of something. And there's the Franklin in the tree. Spotted the leopard. Should I say the Natal spur fowl. Very brave walking around on the floor right next to the leopards. <laughs> You'd call that very brave indeed, wouldn't you, Seb? And down it comes. I wouldn't even know where to look if there's two leopards around. Very, very cool. Very special to be able to find these two again. I haven't been able to see wherever the Daker kill might be. I did see Tundi look up into the tree. Oh, here she comes. Oh! <laughs> Julie, um, it doesn't look like they've got very full bellies. I mean, the lumber's got a little bit of a paunch on her there. It's not too much. And Tundi, yeah, the usual. They've definitely eaten. They've definitely eaten. There's the gorgeous one. And she's going to sneak up on Mum now. Look at that. Mum has no idea that you're coming. No idea. Look at that. Look at the back of the legs. We've seen Hukumuri hunt like this. <laughs> it's cold in the morning. The best thing to do to warm up is to play like this. Very special. Oh, sorry it's behind the tree. There, Mum's teaching her. That she might have gone a little bit too far. This is how you do it, young one. Boom, right in the <laughs> face. <laughs> that was a cheeky shot. <laughs> I don't know if I if if I roll forward an inch, would that help? I don't know. Oh, there we go. Up she goes. Where are you gonna go? Oh, she's go. They do. <laughs> That spray, that spur fell absolutely lost his marbles there. Tundi's eyes were looking really interesting, reflected with the sun coming up behind us. Well, I don't even think yeah, it's the sun yet. Look at that. That's very cool. Very, very cool. Well, there's Columba. Off she goes. Do, 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 do. <laughs> She's just run off into the drainage off the left here. Yeah? Um, she's now lying down, so nothing much to see there. Tweety kit, I have no idea. I've never found any catnip out here in the in the savannah. I don't think it occurs here naturally, but be interesting to see. Maybe we should plant some around FC, around our our camp, and see if we get more leopards coming in and scaring the ladies. There's enough leopards moving past our camp. She's about to come stalk you from the left, yes, Seb. It's coming through the yeah, just there to the right. Yeah, there she is. She's gonna attack Mum again. Mum has no idea, no idea that she's coming. <laughs> I do apologise for any breakup we might have here, folks. Um, we're just in this little drainage depression. There she goes. Very important skill she's got going here. She's going to be launching herself at Mum again very soon. Well, why, why don't we try to sort out our gremlins? Get back over to Taylor. Gremlins, gremlins everywhere. Hey, they're nasty, those things. They really aren't lots of fun. Anyways, <clears throat> nicely done, Steve Orvo, on relocating on Tandy. That's nice to know that she's around. Hopefully, you'll be able to sort out the gremlins soon. So I was telling you a story here. Yeah. Should probably finish it. So yesterday I found out that I will be going back to Kenya. I was gonna say Mars. But then I was like, but I haven't been there yet. Um so so yeah, so Maurice and I will be trekking towards uh, to Kenya. So I don't know if I'll be seeing I've got maybe two game drives left but this afternoon. Well, I've got to finish this one, obviously, and then tomorrow morning, and then I'm going on holiday for a little bit, and then I'm going to Kenya. I don't think I'm going to be coming back to the to Juma for a little bit. So, 
So yes, just in case you think I've disappeared and fallen off the, the face of the earth, I haven't. Yeah. Okay. Just checking here. I don't see any tracks that side. We'll go back towards Tamboti Dan. I can't just go straight, Kirsten. Kirsten's like, just go in. Just, it's fine. Just go. No. <laughs> okay, so I think what we'll do is we'll, we're on Buffelsook boundary now. Um, so this is one of the roads that divides us between Buffelsook and also Torchwood to a point. Get to the corner. So we're going to go to the last place. So Tingana was here at Tamboti Dam. So... <laughs> So Woti Dam is here, and let's see if he crossed over and, and came back south. That will sort of give us a better idea. Otherwise, I'm going to drive Gary Cut Line because that's another one of Tingana's favorite routes. So though he normally walks the other way. He normally goes from Vuyatela Dam along Central and then up Gary Cut Line, and then goes sort of towards Buffalsook Dam. But maybe he's changed it up. I'm not going to be gone forever, so don't worry. I promise I will be back. But um, Maurice misses his home, and he has not been home for a long time. Remember, he was born in Kenya, so he needs to go and visit his family. It's only fair. It's only fair that he's allowed to go visit his family. <laughs> right, we're going to try to find a little bit of our own to have a look at. But off we go back to Stephen and Tandy. Yes, well, we've repositioned. Watch out, here it comes. She's completely invisible in the long grass. Mum has no idea. It's about to go down, folks. We're about to see the fearsome llama stalk pounds and take her mother down. Are you ready? The, the focus is there. The intention. Look at the back. Her back is starting to move a little bit. She's just positioning her feet to get ready for the pounce. This is very important skills. It's going to happen at any moment. Tandy better play her cards right. There we go. She's looked the other way. Oh, Rack lost her attention. <laughs> Look how camouflaged she is, though, folks. Well, got it. <laughs> it's very important skills. It's so cool. We've managed to reposition ourselves into a much better position, and the gremlins have decided to leave us alone. So there we go. That's how it is. The kill's definitely up the tree. The kill's definitely... Ah, oh, there it is. So the kill's definitely in the tree. We've just found, found it now. And he's very precariously or very well positioned it up there a male dacre see by the horns and there's still a fair amount of it up there so they're not eating too much because they know it's secured there would be no hyena in the night to steal that it is as high up in the tamboti tree as it can go yes it is very special to be able to see this folks and to be able to spend time with these wild cats. Is she gonna go up the tree? Whoopsie. <laughs> oh, there we go. A little bit of a stretch. A little bit of a scratch. Clean those nails. You can see her belly has got a fair amount of meat in it now. She definitely you can see the interest, can't you? Look at the eyes. He's looking up. He's thinking, am I hungry enough to go up there right now? Oh. <laughs> it's non-stop. It's non-stop with this little one. <laughs> so important. She gets these takedowns and tackles. Correct. Then you got a year or so with mum to be able to practice all these techniques and to chew at things, whatever that might be.
Well done, James, for finding these yesterday. And it was the distress call that the Dacre made, apparently, that attracted them to this place. And uh, that distress call I've spoken about before, the objective of a distress call is to attract other predators. And, and we've learned that these distress calls indicate an animal being killed, and we also managed to find them. Albeit we don't come in and steal the, the kill from the predator, we come in and just view it and spend some time with them. But it's that reason why a leopard, a cheetah, and a, a, a lioness or two on their own have to kill silently. Because that distress call given off by the prey animal is a beacon. It attracts predators from far and wide. And the purpose of the distress call, obviously, the animal that uses it is to hopefully add some disturbance which will influence the predator that is at the moment trying to kill the animal and then gives them that omen to, to sort of run away. Summer, yes, of course. Um, it is important to understand that the play that they're doing, see, she's going to do it again. The play that they're doing is all about her generating the necessary skills to become a solo hunter. Um, she's not going to have any play later on in life until she gets cubs. So she needs to be able to effectively take down and tackle and kill prey sometimes bigger than herself. So the, the essence of play really is just life lessons for, for the real life she's going to live as a solo huntress. And uh, you've seen Tandi before. She actually growls at Tlalamba when they're feeding because she's not used to sharing <laughs> just behind the tree. She's not used to sharing her food. Sorry, folks, I'm not going to move. We're in a really good position here. And that was one takedown that she did. <laughs> Tandy, you're going to sit right there, are you? Liz, it is great to be experiencing this interaction, 100%. And it's because these animals are a little bit cold as well. Tlalamba's had some meat. <laughs> He's constantly, she's going to come again through the thicket there. Going to come again. Okay, so someone's coming to join me. I'm just going to to help guide them in. Rex, Rex. He's driven past us. That's okay. Rex, Rex with Steve. That's okay. Look at the eyes. Look at the intention. Look how she places her feet. And watch the tail. The tail the tail will be the, the precursor to the attack. Look how she's stalking the leopard stalk. She needs to get used to crouching those ears a little bit lower. Now she's looking intently at mum. Mum is completely unaware. She's busy grooming herself. The attention of the cat. Rex, Rex. Copy, do you know the last position? I'm still there. Okay, I copied. <laughs> he was busy having a fat... Oh, got it! <laughs> he was busy having a fat chat with his guest. He forgot where, where the sighting was. Okay, well, I'm not going to move. We are in a good position. I know that she's just behind the tree at the moment. But uh, as you know, they are moving about. And I don't want to move at all because I don't think we're going to get a better spot, are we, Seb? Lest we lose signal again. Okay, if I, if I reverse biometer, if we suddenly get signal problems, well then. Or how about I go forward a meter? How's that? Okay, there we go. Signal's still fine. Fantastic. Victoria, yeah, I don't 100% know. I think, you know, the cub just starts eating too much of the food, you know, and mum just starts ranging further and further away in search of food and not coming and calling. Um, what Tani's been doing already is she's been, she, <laughs> she's been coming and moving further and further away from Tlalamba um, 
feeding on her own. And then if Columba's nearby, she will come and collect her and come and bring her back for the food. But essentially what happens, see another vehicle has just joined us. Essentially what happens is she'll, she'll just stop calling the, the, the sub-adult because essentially the sub-adult starts becoming quite sort of needy on the meat and deter, uh, needs more of it. Eventually mum will just start hunting on her own and moving away. And then I suppose they just take their leave of each other. They will still start hunting on their own and start being less d dependent on mum. Although she is a constant source of entertainment, as you can see. There we go. She's definitely losing a little bit of the energy. It's probably either time to go up and have a snack. Ooh. There we go. It's time to go get a snack. She's going to try climb up. <laughs> I don't think she's still practicing her climbing skills. Still practicing her climbing skills. She's probably going to get hungry in a minute. She's been expending a fair amount of energy since we've been here. So it's either going to be time for a snack or time for a nap. Hmm, Carol, that's a great question. I have no idea. Um, I would, I would estimate probably about. Sure, I can't even guess. I've got to think about it. I mean, Tandy's probably in the region of 40-odd, 40-plus kilograms. So what's that, about 80, 90 pounds? Kirst, are you, are you saying that's how much she weighs, or are you, are you guessing? Because 25 kgs is a lot. No, that's, she's, that's <laughs> way too much. If she's if she's ten kgs at the moment, I'd say that's a lot. But I really don't know what a what a seven eight month year old leopard cub weighs. I need to look into that. I could go and grab her and pick her up and get an estimate, but no idea. <laughs> Cursed, I I don't know how much a Labrador weighs. <laughs> ten and fifteen, um, Seb reckons. <laughs> This is fantastic stuff, folks. This is really, really interesting. Project Alpha, we reckon about 16. So yeah, between between 10 and 16, it's probably about the, probably about the, oh. Mum is getting a little bit annoyed now. So what's gonna happen with that last question about when is she going to leave her cub and how does it happen? Well, it starts happening like that. Columba starts getting a little bit too physical in her play and uh, Tani starts getting more and more annoyed. And you could tell by her posturing there, she said, okay, enough now, child. And eventually they're probably going to lead to a little bit more of a confrontation where <laughs> mum will just end up leaving. Being like, okay, you're big enough to look after yourself now. There's definitely something of interest down there in the roots, isn't there? It's probably part of the dacre that they've buried. Most of it's up the tree, it seems, but... Oh, where did he go? x ranger you want to know how many kills in how many days? Well, she killed the scrub hare the other morning, then a nyala, and then the dacre. That's what we know about. There could be a handful more scrub hares in there. That's just what we've documented. <laughs> That's just what we've documented. I'm sorry, this is too much, too much fun to watch. But she is a phenomenally successful huntress, and we're hoping that young Kalamba will be learning from the mastery of her mother. She definitely is under her wing, constantly here, yeah, being taught how to play. And you can see the size difference there. She's far smaller than mum. So 16 kilograms, I assume, at the most. Okay, well, we're going to stay here with these playful cats. In the meantime, let's go see how James is getting on on foot. Well, we've returned to camp. We've come back out again. We have a new Bushwalk backpack, uh, alternatively known as an ancient uh, Mongolian torture device. Uh, it is pressing into Senzel's back in various parts, but he's tough. He doesn't mind. 
And we'll continue going along with it. You don't mind, do you, Senzo? He's going... <coughs> anyway, he's quite tough. He'll be fine. Um, I must just make an announcement that uh, tomorrow is that fine man's birthday, he's just told us. So uh, do remember, tomorrow, the 1st of July, to wish Herbert many happy returns. You know, you can develop your... Uh, your uh, rhymes and um, well wishes for tomorrow. Apparently I will have to sing. I will definitely do that. That will make Herbert lie on the floor and roll about laughing. I'll do my best to do that. Okay, so uh, our plan is to head off over here because we can hear the alarm calls of some grey go-away birds. Perhaps we'll come up with Tingana. It's warming up already quite nicely. I think it's going to be a relatively scorchy day for midwinter. I suspect it'll go up to around about 75 degrees, maybe up to 80. Very pleasant indeed. OK, let's see if we can find some biology now that I've given you this update. Ildi, the latest on Hosanna is basically that he's taken up residence in the salubrious accommodations of Londolosi, uh, which is seven kilometers to the south of us here. Uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, a number of you have posted photographs of him and uh, referred to him as our Hosanna, son of the Duke of Juma. And of course, down there, they're very, we don't like to name animals, you see. So he's known as the, the Hosanna male, uh, not as Hosanna, because in some way that is not naming the animal. I don't really understand how that works. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> when we come with our, he's the son of the Duke of Juma, they all they think that's very, uh, that's very difficult for them to understand how we could talk about animals in such human terms. Anyway, it's quite amusing. He's down there. He's uh, performing as always, in his magnificent fashion. All righty. I believe those cats are still being very playful, so let's go back to them. Yes, well, Tandy's getting very annoyed now with the little youngster. <laughs> She's not stopping. She's not letting up. Her mum's getting a little bit growly and snarly at her now. So maybe we should invite a few more viewers on board to see if anyone else can have some fun this morning watching these playful cats. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We are with a leopardess by the name of Tandy and a very playful, rambunctious youngster. <laughs> they have not stopped playing with each other. My mother is getting a little bit annoyed with the antics of her youngster, but yet they're still enjoying a little bit of play. Please post your questions and comments down below. This is 100% live, coming to you from Juma, Sabi Sands. My name is Steve Falkenbridge. I'm joined on camera by Sebastian. Let's go have a look at the nest. They have got a Dacre kill up the tree. You can see their eyes are looking up there. Killed the Dacre last night. Um, and I've, we've got a feeling that in amongst all this play, they are soon going to be going up the tree to feed again. Little Columba herself is about seven and a half, eight months. There's the Dacre. Seb, I think she's going to go up now. Here we go. Here's the adult, Tandy. She's showing the intention of wanting to go up. Watch the strength if she does go up. Katie, you want to know how long the baby will stay with mum? Well, generally, they stay with mum between a year and two years, depending on, on obviously, the sex and uh, what, how conditions are. But it's, on average, about 15 months to a year. Oh, sorry, not 15 months, but 15 months to two years is the average that they'll stick around and eventually they get a little bit too big for mum to, to sort out their food and you can see she's being very playful and soon she's going to be a little bit too big for mum to be enjoying the play because the play comes with teeth and claws 
Look at the intention on her face. As soon as mum looks the other way, she's going to attack her. <laughs> this is 100% live, folks. Kim, this is so special to see. And I don't know if you could hear Tanya there, but she's getting a little bit annoyed. She's making all sorts of sounds now at Lalamba. I can't really hear it. She's making these little grunting sounds, snarling sounds. And Columba is very interested in everything that's going on around her. It's a 100% live and wild scene. Maple's quite relaxed to the vehicle. And she's definitely interested. You can Columba sneaking up on her again. <laughs> Now that was not for us folks, that snarl she did there was 100% for her cub that just is unrelenting this morning. She's about to do it again, she's stalked down behind the little branch. And you see mum is showing signs of annoyance, but that is 100% about her cub. She's probably going to go up the tree now to try and avoid the cub playing with her any longer. And it'll be funny to see if Columba is able to go up with her. masteries of the tree. They will take their kills up there to secure them against hyena and other ground scavenging predators. So having a little bit of a sniff on the ground, some body parts or internal organs of that Dacre have been dropped. You can see that little red on the bottom of the screen there. Just seeing if there's anything of importance that she's dropped. We are loving this too folks, don't you worry. Hashtag, we have got the worst job, they said. There we go, she's got a little bit of meat there. I'm not sure exactly what meat that is. Leopards will start generally on the on the hindquarters of their, their prey and then open up the stomach to feed on all of the internal organs and that looked like a little bit of lung or a bit of, a bit of liver. It's hard to tell. Whatever it was, she thoroughly enjoyed that. You see her intention. Animals are very obvious in their intentions. If you pay attention to their eyes, their body language. Went down the wrong way, I think. Louis, they don't need water too soon afterwards. I mean, they can go for half a day or a full day without water, but it all depends really how far away the water is. Uh, fortunately for her, the water is not more than 100 yards away from where we sit right now. So having the, the kill up a tree like that um, makes it quite easy for her to leave it up there safely and to move towards the water at leisure. See, she's going to go again on the side there. Look at that. The intention. There we go. <laughs> She's Mum is now not tolerating it as much. Before you joined us, she was tackling Mum full speed, full strength, constantly. Enough. The growls and snarls are getting more frequent. And so I think Columba is realizing that Mum's not enjoying the games anymore this morning. We're busy sniffing under that tree. It's a very good possibility that that's where she made the kill. Philip, yes, I do think they do. I do think they do. I mean, for example, we have got a, a male leopard around called Tingana, who's the Duke of Juma. He's the, potentially the father of this youngster here. And his sort of two-year-old, two two two-and-a-half-year-old two and a half year old male, Hosanna, was hanging around. And um, they interacted with each other. And there was no real negative sort of behavior between them, which is quite interesting. There was a little bit of snarling and growling, but similar to what you see now. So I think they do know their, their offspring. I mean, it's all about smell in the leopard kingdom. And there's obviously a lot, a lot of visual two things, but they've got an enormous, enormous ability to, to smell and, and recognize things through smell. I know they're just hiding behind the bushes there. I do apologize for that. Ellen, yes, well, where we are, we're up in the northwest, uh, eastern part of, of our traverse. Um, and there's a male leopard to the north of us called Gajima, who potentially could be a threat to her and her cub. 
and not necessarily to her, but um, if he wanted to mate with her, he would kill her cub. Uh, there's another male that comes in from the west, his name is Hukumuri, um, and he's been moving in steadily since February and sort of encroaching on the territory of the, the resident Duke. And all of these sort of potentially other males are, have the potential to, to cause damage and whatever to the population. But it is all natural, it's all part and parcel of what happens out here. Said, so do I need to move back an inch? Okay, we are looking at a Tamburti branch with no leopard. Okay. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us for this very short little episode. If you'd like to continue watching, we're still live for a couple hours, so just Google Safari Live. And thank you for your comments and questions. We'll see you next time. Folks, we're going to move back an inch or two. And while we do that, let's go and see how Taylor's getting on with her alarm calls. They've stopped. There's now no sign of anything anywhere. So we've been on no fresh tracks other than those go away birds that we had alarming a little while ago. The bush has gone very, very quiet. Who's this now? Is this Herbert looking for me on the radio? I don't know. It's going to keep in my hand in case Herbie does try to call me. So I think we might loop back around, go back up the main Gallagher Road towards Bufflesook Boundary. So I don't know if he was going south or if he was going west. Oh, no. It's not, uh, not looking for me. Sean, now out of the leopards, it, honestly, in my opinion, after seeing the various uh, male leopards paw prints, I think Gajima is a leopard that so we don't often get to see. He hangs around a little bit north from here in Buffalo's Hook. Occasionally, he pops on either here near Gallagher Road and pretty much the fire break all the way down to Cheetah Cutland to that boundary. But he doesn't come too far into Juma. He just sort of stays on the outskirts. That's where um, Tengana and his territory sort of cross one another's paths. You often find at like water points um, you'll have a, a, you know, a, a boundary of a variety of different animals that have territories because it's a mutual point. Um, so yeah, so once when I was with VM, we very briefly got a view of Kajima and we looked at his paw prints and I kid you not, if I if I hadn't seen him there, I probably would have called them lion tracks. Not joking. He's got massive feet. Absolutely huge feet. And I've also seen Quarantine's tracks before, which is one of Karula's offsprings, one of her older sons, but he, he doesn't hang around here. He's further east in Torchwood and Koro, Cheetah Plains, that area. He um, He's also got rather large feet, but not anywhere near the size of a Gajima. I'm, I'm, I'll try and have a look on my phone. I think I may have actually taken a picture in comparison to Tandy's tracks because he stood next to Tandy, and it looked like a, a big lioness and her cub walking next to her with the size of the footprints. It is, it is insane to see. So, yeah, that was a serious eye-opening experience. And even the one picture I got of him, his feet are massive. Just as he's sitting there in the road watching us. He's got big, big feet. Okay, so we're coming up to the area now where the go away birds are sort of calling. Just, that's actually a little bit further up, but I just want to check in here nicely because he does like to use the animal pathways that hang on the drainage line. Now, I know James in the area hoping to get a good glimpse of the Okay, Yes, I am hoping to get a glimpse of a leopard in this area. That's why I'm talking quite quietly. We're sitting in front of an unusual stand of Symbopogon grass. It's called Symbopogon or Turpentine grass. I just like the sound of the word Symbopogon. I don't know why. And interestingly, it has become the home of a spider in here. Now, a spider here has drawn all of these inflorescences together and possibly laid its eggs in there and then quite possibly also dropped dead after one season of life. But it's a very clever place.
to put your web or your egg sack because simba pogan smells like turpentine so it's got this very kind of um aromatic oil that stops animals preying on it and i wonder if that's not why the spider chose the plant now i'm not going to take obviously the egg sack just take this and you can see very fine hairs on the seeds and in order to get the smell of the turpentine what you have to do is crush it up and smell it but normally it has to be fairly fresh now there's almost no turpentine smell at all so I wonder if that's not why the spider chose this uh, particular plant to put her egg sac I hope all you little spiders make it through the winter. We've got another, oh, let's say one month to go before it starts to warm up. Four weeks. Winter here, very long, eight weeks. Four of them are done. We still have one or two alarm calling birds around here, and so we're still looking for the leopard, but who knows what will happen. Now we've had a lot of questions of late about fire and the regulation thereof and what we do in the case of bushfires and coal, but if you're wondering if there's any uh, regulation therefore on, the, on smoking, uh, in my humble opinion the only regulation there should be on smoking is that it shouldn't be allowed. It is the foulest and most antisocial habit I can imagine. Uh, that's just my little rant for the day. But no, there is no you know, there's no regulation at all around smoking, given the fire hazards here. Uh, it's very unlikely that a cigarette could be tossed out here. There are, you mean, you're not allowed to smoke on game drive normally, because it just ruins the smell of the atmosphere. And so, in general, people are not allowed to smoke on game drive. Um, and certainly, that it was an enormous fire in Cape Town about three years ago, that was started by a guy flicking a cigarette out of his uh, out of his window. Somebody actually watched it happen, and it set the entire Cape, uh, the whole Cape Mountain National Park on fire. But no, there are no regulations on smoking in the wilderness. Official ones, anyway. Foul, foul activity it is. All right, let's have a little look at this bush. A young and very good looking example of the Ch not Richelia, Senegalia Berkii, the black monkey thorn. And it's just the reason we're stopping so frequently here now is that Herbie is just checking for tracks of Tingana. And so we are going to look at smaller things while we're here. And although this might be confused by, for a knob thorn sometimes on account of the fact that the thorns do appear to grow out of knobs, you can see there, the big difference, of course, is the fact that the leaves or the leaflets are much smaller. And there are more of them per leaf. So that is Senegalia. Steve had a dead one. Taylor's got a living one. Look at what we found. We have got a common dacre here, which is quite cool. Now, I'm just speaking softly. The reason why is because I'm hoping it walks back in this direction. It's been standing here for a little while now. And the reason, well, actually, I spotted it was first the bones from a buffalo carcass. And Goombas ate a buffalo here once, last year sometime, just off of the road. And this dacre was actually standing in and amongst the bones. Now, I wonder if it was chewing on one of those bones. Let's see if it will come back. But how's that? How camouflaged is that creature? In case you've just started watching, um, it's off to the left. But that was a great representation of just how these antelope, especially the small ones, blend in. I mean, the color of this girl's coat is just unbelievable. It, it, it matches perfectly. I mean, I don't even think there's some paint specialists that could match the paint up or the color of uh, this animal's coat to the grass. Have you ever had that where you've had to go and get your car repaired and it always seems to be a slightly different color to what your vehicle actually is. But anyway, nature of course is incredible and it, I feel like nature, mother nature is a perfectionist. 
Ruby, this is very precious. You're quite correct. You can even see the her nose is wet. You can see it glistening every now and then from the sunlight. Hello, beautiful girl. I mean, I'm pretty sure she knows that we know she's there. But she's just deciding not to flee. She's quite happy to just stand around. That's stunning. Now the duck-ducks, which are smaller than the Daker, they're funny-looking creatures. Their snouts are so amusing. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing a few more of those small antelope species in the Mara. Off you go. Boing, 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 boing. Bouncy bounce. You can see why sometimes people think that they are hares and rabbits and things like that, the way that they do bounce about. Okay, still no luck on Tingana. I'm just, like I said, I'm just slowly driving going back up this way, back up to the boundary, have a little look. No leopard tracks coming out the side yet, nothing over the top of my tracks. I think I'll probably turn around here. I don't think he would have turned around and come back up this way. Uh, Carol, I have not seen all the different animal species chewing on bones. Let's quickly go through. I've seen giraffe, I've seen kudu, I've seen inyala, impala. I have seen uh, daker chewing on bones before. I have seen, who else have I seen? I feel like that's maybe it. But I'm sure that the animals use different things to get the nutrients that they need. So. I don't think that uh, osteophagy is, is limited to just a certain group of species. I'm pretty sure if, if everybody's lacking phosphorus and calcium, they're probably going to nibble on bones. Something like a tortoise would be, is, is unable to really chew on a bone, so what they do is they actually just go straight ahead and eat the hyena dung, which is clever, because they're getting high contents of calcium carbonate, which of course is very important for shell growth as well. So um, they tend to do that. You might find that some of the other smaller creatures will do something very similar. Maybe they also just eat the hyena dung straight. In because when it dry, when it's all dry, it's um, it's like just like a fine powder. It really breaks up so well. So it's much easier for them to eat rather than chewing something like a bone. I've never actually seen a. There's a little little Franklin in the road. Don't go into the grass. You never go into the grass. Don't be silly. Um, we'll see if it feeds out again. Um, yeah, so I'm, not, I'm sure, I don't think it's just limited to the animals that I said, but um, just because I haven't seen it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. I'm picking little seeds now off of the road. And I think it's a good idea that we just slowly move up and down here, because I'm, I'm almost certain that this cat is, is in between where James is and in between where we are, and hopefully either way where the leopard will come out towards us now something that we still need to catch live which is why we try and keep uh, finding those dakers hopefully we'll see one chomping on a rodent of sorts that'll be exciting anyways i'm going to send you, send you back across uh, to steve volvo i think he's still with tandy yes of course we are still with tandy and there hasn't been too much of a, of a vehicle pressure on the radio. So we will stay here as long as we possibly can. Columba seems to be sleeping somewhere. We can't find her. I think her energy has, has dwined, has waned. Sorry, I think I just invented a word there. And Tundi is now looking quite peaceful. Not as peaceful as Taylor said, or as relaxed as our Daker. Very relaxed. Holly, um, vultures can't really see this kill. It kind of blends in with the branches itself. So, um, And also, it was done quite late last night in the afternoon. Um, vultures normally are moving during the daytime, and um, they can't see this, so invariably they don't find it. Uh, animals such as the, the tawny eagle, uh, the hooded vulture, as well as the Batelier sometimes are the first ones to find a kill, but they often don't find leopard kills because they're in the tree and they can't get to them, they can't see them. One of the reasons also why leopards take them up a tree, because um, you actually will find hyena and lion following vultures in the 
the Masai Mara, they do that a lot. They actually follow vulture activity in order to find dead animals and kills. And that's where the competition comes from. But vultures, unless the leopard leaves it on the ground in the open, they don't generally find things like this. I mean, we're quite close to that. Have a look. As I said, pans out. You can't actually even see it. It just looks like a piece of the tree, doesn't it? I mean, we were here for about 10 minutes before we found the kill. And now that the light is coming, you start seeing a little bit of the colors. But not only is the daker invisible, where is that leopard? There she is. Incredible, isn't she? How well camouflaged she is. Beautifully camouflaged. What a week we've had with Tundi. Incredible, really. She's just proving to everybody that she is the star of the show. Cheers, Rex. Rexon from Juma is, is leaving with his guests. I think they saw my coffee and got a little bit jealous. Tori, you want to know what the chances of a first-time mum successfully raising a cub? Well, it's very possible. I mean, I really don't statistically know. I mean, instinctively, it is what these animals sort of know how to do. You know, I mean, I really don't have the statistics for you. I mean, my, my honest experience with visibly or spending a lot of time with leopards and cubs is quite limited. I think I've spent the most amount of time with leopards and cubs since I've been here. Uh, the Sabi Sands is in a phenomenal place to view these things. Um, James might be a better person to answer that question, but essentially first-time mums obviously are not as successful as second, third-time mums. It's just the way it works. They they pick the wrong den site. They don't really have the experience. They, they're not used to sharing. Um, but the motherly the motherly bonds just come naturally to most of them so they know how to suckle they know how to defend their youngsters but they might just not select the right area so that is where the problem comes if you select a den site that is vulnerable to a hyena attack or to other predators for example that is invariably where the youngsters uh, lose their lives it's not that the mother is has been a bad mother and not provided the milk or the food it's just the den site selection could be quite poor and that obviously comes with a bit of practice, a bit of experience, and I believe Tundi has used some very similar areas during her time on Juma for rearing her cubs, and she's had a lot of success. Whereas her sister, apparently Shadow, was a very poor mother with regards to successful cubs. So it really is, it's just a, I suppose it might be a situational thing, it might be an individual thing, it might be... It might be, could be a whole lot of factors, really. I mean, I wasn't here to witness it all, but just the stories I've heard is Tunny's done very, very well, and Shadow didn't do too well with regards to cubs in the past, as a as an average goes. I don't want to upset anyone out there. I honestly don't know enough about it with regards to the two individuals, but they were they were sisters, and yet differences in their ability were quite pronounced. So it really is a, an individual thing. And uh, I suppose a successful mother passes on traits to successful daughters and that trait kind of moves backwards with them. So lion would be quite a sort of vulnerability here. Lions would quite easily move in and, and kill the, uh, steal the, the food as well as possibly kill the cubs, even the adult himself so we're going to be going back over to James to see what he's looking at I'm opening up the pod of Peltiforum Africanum or the um, I've forgotten the English name oh yes the weeping wattle and we're going to have a look at the seed here it comes everybody are you ready well while you look at the seed I'm going to tell you that Senzo uh, as a theory for why Shadow wasn't a good mother, he says maybe she didn't want to be a mother. So I said, I'm really not sure. From what I understand of leopard behavior, you know, if you come into Eastern and you don't mate with the dominant male, then, you know, it could be particularly dangerous for you. So maybe, you know, she was just uh, seeking out protection from Tingana when mating with him and she didn't actually want to be a mother.
Uh, I think that's a ridiculous theory myself, but I do appreciate uh, that Senzel came up with it. Hook on to the other side, and it'll draw them together to make a little egg sac or nest. Otherwise, I suppose that could be the sort of support line for the beginning of an actual web. But you can see from its condition that it's starting to fray, and that's because the summer's over. Long since now. And now the spider is either living somewhere dormant in this tree, or it has died. Many spiders live for only one season. Their eggs making it through the winter, and then the hatchlings, hatchlings, what do you call them hatchlings? Spiderlings hatching early on in the summertime. So that was Peltiform Africanum, the weeping wattle. This would be a good Zizifos tree to do the competition of who can eat the most Zizifos leaves, but I've done that and I'm still in the lead as far as I'm concerned, so I'm not going to do it again. But what I am going to do is pull this coffee substitute from the top and I'm going to eat it. These buffalo thorns are actually quite nice to eat. The, the fruits, they're sort of a very subtle taste. There's nothing subtle about the thorns. I think these ones may well. 43 leaves, but she didn't swallow them, did she? Did she swallow them? This is Taylor, who said she had 43 leaves. She didn't swallow them, so she has no legs to stand on. I had 37 swallowed. There we are. This one is like a stone. I think they're beyond their best. Well beyond. Yeah, you can see it's actually quite woody inside. That's a pity. So not much to eat out here if you want to survive and I've often people have often said you know do you think you could survive out here in the wilderness without anything to eat you know could you live off the land and I've often said that I don't think that it would be possible unless you could hunt especially through the winter time there are tubers and roots that you can find to eat uh, you could I suppose eat termites if you needed to in fact termites would probably be the bulk of your protein and fat unless you were prepared to or able to hunt birds and antelope but in terms of vegetable matter, I think you'd really struggle, especially during the winter time. Carol, I think spider webs, you know, like that one we saw there, will start to fray in the weather. But I don't see any reason why a spider web shouldn't last almost indefinitely if it's, you know, not being rained on or blown on or having things climbing up and down it. I think actual, you know, the kind of Kevlar-like substance that they make their webs out of would probably survive, um, yeah, indefinitely. It's, it's inorganic. Well, it's, it can't be inorganic. It's organic, but it's, it doesn't rot. So I think it would last a long time. You know, silk obviously lasts, from silkworms, lasts forever. Uh, if you happen to make a kimono out of it or something like that, um, I'm sure it's treated slightly. But, uh, yeah, I think it would last forever. I don't think there's any reason why it shouldn't. Herbert, what have you found? He hasn't found anything. And so we are going to go and have a conversation while Steve looks at his lazy leopards. Lazy, well, it's about to go down. Tundi's unaware. Talumba's been playing pretend for a long time that she's not interested. She's stalking up behind her mother once again. The game that never gets old. I think she's allowed Tundi to relax a lot. She's right behind her. The tail flicks. She's very interested in attacking that tail. Can't help it. Oh, she's starting to lose interest. She's been stalking her for about five meters. Something's moved off in the distance. They seem to get their attention, but now they're relaxed again. Oh, I thought that was going to be a takedown. Aegis, that's a great question. Now, when leopards disperse, um, 
well, invariably, if you look at cats, predatory cats, um, the males disperse and the females normally sort of stay. So in lions, the females will stay in the pride, so they kind of perform part of the territorial defense. And um, in leopards, um, the females will sort of carve out a section of the territory or move next door, you know, kind of move into an area that's available for them. And slowly that territory will probably get bigger as their mother gets older and as uh, female leopards nearby move off or, or potentially die. They just kind of fill the gaps, so to speak. But it's males that invariably disperse and move from their natal area because if they stayed around here, they'd end up breeding with their sisters and their, their aunties and their relatives. And that's not ideal. That's not what you want. So you'll, you'll see them deliberately being pushed away. It's not that they want to leave. They probably want to stay. Those of you who've been watching the show for quite some time will know how Hosanna has really formed part of everyone, everyone's heart. He was the favorite for a lot, for me included. But eventually he's been pushed, and now he's gone south to an area where he can meet individuals that are not related to him and maybe carve out a territory there for himself. But this little Tlalamba will very likely just carve out a small territory that sort of adjoins her mothers and no doubt they will interact from time to time but once they become dependent independent I mean then uh, there's not as much love given not as much tolerance you know that if Tlalamba has a kill later on when she's a an adult and Tani decides she wants it well she could invariably come and take it from her with no love lost that's all competition and that is what drives the species on. They're not soft at all. Even now there's competition between them. Tandy's eating as much as she can before calling Tlalamba. I mean, she had that enormous um, Nyala the other day. She thought, okay, well, we can share this quite easily. And then she made this Daker kill and not too much has been eaten. So she called her cub because she's going to be here for the whole of today and maybe even tomorrow. So it makes sense to to do the babysitting at the same time get the playfulness out the way which seems to, have, seems to have happened already this morning as both cats are warmed up it's time for a little cat nap but we're hoping one or both of them are going to be going up the tree soon to have another feed Dash, Dash, she's, she's been stalking already for some time. Um, leopard cubs are able to stalk almost from the day they're born. Not very successfully, though. Um, their success rate gets better and better as they get older and as their experience improves. But I have no doubt she has the potential to catch small quarry, small prey. I doubt she's able to, to catch an impala or anything like that. But uh, I mean, a daker might also be a bit too loose of her, but she's still going to give it a go. Anything that moves, really, mum's tail, a branch, uh, an ant, anything that runs around and moves in front of them, they will have to catch. They just can't help themselves. But. Uh, as she gets older so from a year onwards I think she's going to be much more successful in her approach but even as an adult leopards have a success rate of 20% that's even with experience so I'm sure she's going to chase a lot of things before she actually catches them we haven't actually seen her with anything yet that she's physically caught but that's not to say she hasn't sorry about my break Seb I should have pushed that before there's definitely something down towards the dam that keeps attracting their attention. Some movement. It might just be Scuba Steve, who we noticed had returned from his, his Friday night wonders. Wherever he was yesterday, he's back. And the Tundi is a flat cat, although quite attentive. That little Gwari branch there. Would you like me to move up, Seb? Maybe we should. We're just going to move up a couple meters. Hopefully we don't lose any signal here. Bye. Say so when, Sebastian. Okay. That is a good spot. What are we going to do? 
Sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened to Stivo Vo 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 there. But he seems to have lost himself some signal sins or has spotted something. What is that? What are you looking at? What this this bit of tree there? Oh, I see what you mean. That is interesting. It's fresh. It's some sort of dung. Probably caterpillar fresh. That's fascinating, actually. Let's have a little investigation. I'm going to break the stick off, or certainly bend it back, and then let's see what's underneath here. It's been laced together with silk. I'm just going to pull a small piece of it away. really very interesting. I can't see anything inside there. It's being held together, laced together with silk. I can only think that this is some kind of communal cocoon made perhaps by some communal caterpillars. There isn't anything in it at the moment, so I'm just going to peel it away. I'm not too worried about damaging anything if we didn't find anything in that first bit. I'd love to know if anyone's got any idea what this is. Let us know. I believe that <laughs> no one has offered any suggestions just yet. The good news is a, a nest full of dead ants. No, no, this is not ants. It's got silk in it, which means it must be spiders, I suspect, or caterpillars. It's not spiders. I think this is some kind of caterpillar that has created a safe haven from its dung and from silk. But there doesn't seem to be anything resident at the moment. It is very interesting, Senzor. Thank you very much for finding that for us. the first thing he's come up with today other than his theories like I say most of which are not repeatable yeah I don't know what that is I'd be fascinated to know flat earth you say an egg nest are there no eggs in here it's just dung it looks like caterpillar dung <laughs> King was his refined fat. I'm sure poking fun at my tree tires on diet the other day. Oh, refined sap. Um, could it be sap? No, it's not sap. Come and look here. Okay, here, here's a slightly, I suppose, small part of answer. Starlight, it smells like... Nothing. Doesn't smell of anything. In fact, here's a better example. Whatever it was has been eating the wood here. So they've used the wood as a food source. And they've used the wood at the nodes. In fact, if you look over here, there's an even bigger one. It's the bark they're going for. They're eating the bark. And then they're obviously creating this little safe haven of dung. You know what? They're not using it as a cocoon. They're making this little safe haven of dung and silk as they feed. Which means they'll be safe from the sun and from predators. So as they feed, they push the dung out, probably on the end of a little piece of silk. They keep eating and keep eating until they have this protective layer. So whatever it was was probably active in the summer, might actually still be active in some part of this protective nest. Very interesting indeed. I'm sure you're all fascinated, aren't you? Much more so than uh, with Tundi and her cub. Kirsten is being sarcastic again in my ear. It's not very helpful, you know. I'm trying desperately to do my best here and get nothing but sarcasm in my ear. Anyone would think that I delivered such sarcasm myself. <laughs> it's 
something that is never sarcastic. In fact, that's not true. I think mongoose are possibly the most sarcastic animals out here. Yeah, but the thing is, is that we've got slender mongoose. What? How bizarre is this? Two of them. That's insane. I've never seen two together before. They're just freezing cold, warming themselves up on that termite mound. This is so cool. This is really amazing. Now, I, at first I thought, are those really large squirrels because of the coloration on their bodies? And then I saw the dark tail and also went there about three times the size of a squirrel and a dwarf mongoose. Much, much bigger. Not quite, not quite as big as a banded mongoose, or at least not robust. But they are fairly long creatures. But I've never seen this before. This is already hands down the best, uh, the best um, mongoose sighting that I think I've ever had in terms of a slender mongoose. So I think Fergus just fiddling there, so the camera is just bouncing around a little bit. There we go. How awesome is that? Now they're obviously really cold. Normally we wouldn't be able to watch something like this. They normally see us and then completely disappear. So very, very unusual, very unusual indeed. Now they've got very, very long tails. And my favorite thing about, of course, these creatures is the way that they curl their tails up and almost over to the top of their head when they run. Maybe we'll be able to see it. I don't know if it's maybe a mom and a youngster. I don't know if the one on the left looks quite as big as the one on the right. I also unfortunately don't know very much about slender mongoose. I mean, it's a, it's a creature that we don't often get to see. So I'm going to have a look to see how many youngsters, how many pups I would assume they're called the same as uh, dwarf mongoose youngsters, how many they have at any, at any given time. This is amazing. Slender mongoose, page 333. I'm just actually having a look in my mammals book. Like I said, this is hands down the best slender mongoose sighting I've ever had in my entire life. I know Scott obviously tr uh, trumps it with his um, black mung mamba versus slender mongoose trying to eat a scrub hair. That's, that was a crazy sighting. Do you all remember that? And then otherwise we don't normally get to get these great sightings. Shame this poor book has been been through so much. I just want to have a look. I also want to try and find out if they have a particular time of the year that they breed. That's the cool thing about um, about guiding is that obviously you try and learn as much as you can but typically the animals that you're seeing often is the information that you retain for a little bit longer. Otherwise it's so difficult to try and remember everything. So I'm trying to see here. Life history. Yeah. Gestation. Normally litters of one or two are born. October to March. So not quite the right time, but I mean, that doesn't look particularly young. So maybe it was born in at the end of March. It would make sense. Otherwise, it would be sort of a male and female. But I don't think that, because I think the one on the left is much smaller than the one on the right. So perhaps this is mother and youngster, which will be very special. That could be a safari live first. Laura, I think these mongoose are slightly puffed up today. That's why they also look very, very fluffy. But a banded mongoose is, is, is quite fluffy. And then if you also look at a white-tailed mongoose, you've seen them, their hair is quite long too. So other than a, a, a yellow mongoose and, and the dwarf mongoose, they seem to be, I don't know, I don't know if their hair is... Well, dwarf mongoose have got fairly short coats, but the hair actually isn't that long. I, like I said, I think it's because they're fluffed up at the moment. That's exaggerating it, but I'd actually go and say that a white-tailed mongoose uh, has, has probably got the longest hair of the lot. What about a water mongoose? Maybe even a water mongoose. I'm just going to check page 339. It's becoming a little bit uncertain now. 339, just going to page one more. Yeah, and water mongoose probably got, are fairly hairy creatures too. That's amazing to see them all sprawled out. Now, my one of my favourite mongoose are the yellow mongoose, which we see a lot of down in in, in the eastern Cape of South Africa. They're actually everywhere, and they're incredible. They eat a lot of puff adders and and um, and Cape cobras 
which is amazing. And the slender mongoose will do very uh, something very similar. You know, a dwarf mongoose might not necessarily go after snakes, but a slender mongoose would definitely go after a snake or something along those lines. So let's creep around. Let's see. Ages, I mean, I'm going to take a gamble here. I don't know what would happen between a slender mongoose and a colony of dwarf mongoose. I think they'd probably just go their separate ways. I don't think that they would necessarily interact with one another. Let's just creep here. I mean, I doubt we're going to get very close to them at all. I'm just going to keep an eye out. They could have already run. Maybe we'll see their tracks on the ground. I can't believe that was an amazing sighting. They didn't, they didn't do very much, but I mean, just to see them. Nah. They must have gone ducked down somewhere, but I can't see them anymore. Um, my safari, no, the, the slender mongoose are, are diurnal. The ones that you're thinking of that are nocturnal are water mongoose are nocturnal and then also the white-tailed mongoose I have not seen a water mongoose up here I mean I wouldn't be surprised if they did occur in this area but you again with as the name suggests water you'd find them down in areas where there's, where there's rivers and things like that, the same places where you find the otters they spend a lot of time in the water and um, Again, we used to see lots of water mongoose down in the eastern Cape of South Africa, well, where we were at two rivers, the Bushmans and the Karika River, both tidal rivers, which were really nice. So we, we got to see them fairly regularly, especially if you were out on a night drive, you'd see them quickly scurrying across the open. Um, so, yeah, so no, you don't normally see the slender out at night, but again, yeah, anything can happen. What happens if something chased a mongoose out of its hidey hole? Gosh, sure. Lots, lots and lots and lots of mongoose, hey? And I don't even think I've seen half of them. I've seen yellow, I've seen small grey, I've seen slender, I've seen water mongoose, I've seen white-tailed mongoose, I've seen banded mongoose, I've seen large grey mongoose. Let's see what else we've got here. This is just Southern Africa, so that's seven. Actually, let's have a look here. Let's go to the first one. Oh, there's so many! Okay, me cats. What do we got here? Oh, the Salu mongoose. I have not seen a Salu mongoose. That's that one over here. But I reckon Brent has. I don't know if Steve has or James. Maybe James has too. I'm not sure, but I've not seen one of those before. Um, so that seems to be right far. If we look up here, right far. Uh, in, in South Africa, we were going to see them would be right at the north. So maybe you'd see the Salu mongoose, maybe like Mapungupwe, maybe the Limpopo National Park around there. And then we've got the bushy tailed mongoose. Have you seen one of these? Where did you see that? A Salu. Where did you see it? In Zambia. Okay. Very nice. Sorry, my nails are also really dirty. I've been digging around today. Um, I have not seen a bushy tailed mongoose either, though. Uh, yellow mongoose, this is the one I was telling you about. That one's quite nice. I've seen lots of them. Large grey or the Egyptian mongoose I have seen before. Uh, how do you even say that? The Kako land. How do you say that? Kako. Kako land. Slender mongoose. I've not seen one of those. Kakako. I don't know. Remember, if, if any of you follow my Instagram, you would have seen I posted a picture of the small grey, uh, small grey mongoose. They're naughty, naughty little creatures. Mela's mongoose. <laughs> I'm sorry, sneezing. Sorry. The gun. I felt like there was a second one coming along. Sorry, I'm now. I was trying to work out if I'm going to sneeze or not. Sorry, Ferg, I've just spotted something. Hang on. Do you see what I'm looking at? Oh, it's an Inyala. 
man, I got so excited. I thought it was a lion walking through the bush. It wasn't. It was a Nyala, but very, very far away. Sorry, Shamson. I'm um, Shamson. I, I don't know if these creatures can all interbreed with one another. I, I wouldn't think so because a lot of there's a lot of different mongoose species already all coexisting and they're naturally occurring here. So, um, you, you know, with uh, subspecies of animals which can typically interbreed with one another, they're basically the same animal except there'll be some slight, maybe some physical uh, or appearances that will be slight different, and that's just because um, of the area that they're living in. They, you know, some we move south, and some might move further north, and then they live there for a long time, and then they adapt to those surroundings. And um, so, no, I, I would say no that these mongoose species that are all living and occur within the same area, I don't think that they can interbreed with one another at all. They're all different species. Um, okay. So the other thing, though, that I wanted to tell you was, before we saw the slender mongoose, was that I heard lions roaring, which was great. Oh, here's another species of mongoose. I'm going to show you. There's one that's sitting up in the grass that we might get. Over there is a dwarf mongoose. Hi. Hi, little dwarf mongoose. Um, we're all heading in the direction of the roaring lions, but I don't think they're on the property. I think they're further south of our traverse. But we'll go down that way anyways. So here is the smallest of the uh, of the mongoose. And there were a whole group of them. Again, everybody, all the birds, all the small mammals, they're all feeding in the areas where Rexon has come through and cut open fire breaks again. So where that short grass is, uh, uh, that's been recently recently cut open, there's another mongoose. So they're making use of it. Like I said, I think there'll be a lot of insects and things gathering under that grass just for warmth. Try and keep off, try and keep out of the wind. Good place to hide, yes. Yeah, so we're going to watch you run out across the road. Head, it was headed in that direction. Perhaps it stopped to just check. Again, very vulnerable. There's another one. <laughs> There's a whole family of them moving around here. Anyways, we're going to keep heading towards the boundary now. Off you go to James, who apparently is admiring a tree. <laughs> I'm admiring a deceased tree. And to me, it seems that this tree has deceased more than once, which, of course, is not possible. One can only die once, as one can only live once unless one is reincarnated. And I do not believe that this tree has been reincarnated, certainly not in the current form that it is right now. It may have been reincarnated as Senzo behind me. Are you feeling a spiritual connection with this tree? You are. Anyway, I'll tell you why I say I think that it looks like it's died twice. It's been standing a very long time as a dead knobthorn tree. And you can see that the first layer was eaten away, the bark, by probably termites. And now they've created for themselves a little home in between the first and second layers of wood. And they've slowly, over the years, eaten away these layers here. So they've got underneath the bark. Well, it's not the bark. They've got underneath a layer of wood. And they've eaten up underneath it, which means they've been able to concentrate on this tree for years and years without being disturbed by predators and by the sun, and also by uh, something like a woodpecker. So a woodpecker could probably drill maybe through wood that thick. Yeah, in fact, it could definitely drill through wood that thick. But I suspect that they managed to get deep enough that they were unaffected by too many woodpecking birds. It really is quite astounding. If you come around this side, they've eaten away a layer of wood from the bottom to the top of this tree. You see that? All of this here, of it's about half an inch thick, they've eaten it. And I think that the mound that they came from is directly underneath the tree, and I also think it's now dormant. I don't think there are any termites left here. They, too, have gone the way of all flesh. And here is the remnants of where they used to live. Isn't that interesting? I think it's fascinating. So dry wood termites, these ones, I suspect. Although there is a bit of a mound here, it's hardly a, a giant mound. So I don't think that they were the normal fungus growers. I'm just bashing it away a bit to see if I'm, in fact, correct. 
that there's nothing in there. Yeah, no, it's all dormant. Really interesting. Ah. <laughs> Love, hope, faith. You say my voice makes you feel like you're in a mystery novel. Well, <laughs> I think that's a good thing. Is it a good thing? I hope it's a good thing. Certainly it's a mystery where Tingan has gone. Um, Herbert is convinced he remains in this block here. We found one track heading into this block. We've now circled the whole block and we found nothing coming out. And so Herbert thinks he's inside here. So we'll keep looking around. He doesn't like to be found on foot, so it's quite possible he's seen us and just ducked into the grass and not been seen. A leopard like Hukumuri, for example, or Tandi, uh, are not nearly quite as... Uh, not afraid. I guess he is. He's afraid of people on foot. He doesn't like it. He likes to be seen either from vehicles or not at all. So that's our pal Ting. -na 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 -na. Uh, some of us are, uh, Jason. The Steve, for example, is definitely a verified tree hugger. Uh, he is. Uh, I mean, by tree hugger, I'm assuming you mean uh, somebody who is. Well, I don't know. What, what, do you, what do we define as a tree hugger? Um, Steph likes to hug trees, so he's definitely a tree hugger. I describe Steve as a tree hugger because he's also very vegetarian, so he's, he's, very, conscious of, um, he's very conscious of the effect that he has on the environment. Uh, and, you know, that's why he's a vegetarian, I think. I think that's why he's a vegetarian. Anyway, uh, I consider myself something of a tree hugger, although I'm uh, certainly not a vegetarian. I do enjoy the odd cuddle with a tree. I'm not sure Taylor's a tree hugger. I guess we probably are all tree huggers. It's starting to feel a bit awkward. I feel like I'm giving uninvited affection to this tree. Let's go across to the vegetarian and find out for us. For, 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 for. Okay, well, that was a very mumbled link. Thanks, Kirst. Well, so, James, the tree stroker. I'll be a tree hugger any day. James can stroke as many trees as he wants to. <laughs> well, we have got... We have... We have got some very flat cats now. They've stopped moving. Sorry, sorry, Chris, did you say we were discussing why I'm a vegetarian? Oh, so I need to just let everybody know why I'm a vegetarian. Okay, well, first of all, there's an ethical reason behind it. I, I believe that the, the over-commercialization of meat in the world is a problem from an e ecological point of view. Uh, we're not managing the organic waste provided by uh, livestock farming. And there's huge, huge impacts on the fisheries, on the rivers, on the oceans. That's all derived from not only the animals' waste themselves, but from the fertilizer and waste produced from the enormous amounts of the areas that are mowed down and chopped down to provide the food to feed these livestock animals. 70% of the food grown in the world is fed to livestock. So if you want to cure world hunger, we could maybe start by by feeding ourselves what we grow rather than feeding it to animals. And second of all, a lot of animals are taken away. Cows, for example, from their mother the day they're born and then put in a box and then grown to be fed to us and uh, taken away from the mum so that she can keep producing milk on a non-stop basis so as to uh, constantly provide milk and then she's impregnated again. It's this constant cycle of of regeneration so I don't think those animals are living a very ethical life very happy life and then uh, the third point is that the meditation I practice is all about energy and if an animal if I'm doing everything about eliminating suffering in my life and then I go and I eat an animal that suffered I'm going to take on the energy that they have experienced and that's basically I'm going in reverse so I hope that answers it I'm not trying to change anybody else's opinion Let's go back to the leopards way more entertaining than that um, I'm not trying to change anyone's opinion, but I do what I need to do. There we go. Are you looking up at the food, Lalamba? She doesn't mind meat, but her meat is free-range and organic. No fertilizers or pesticides required to grow it. There's no over-exploitation. 
So I'm definitely a proponent for if I grew my own meat, I would probably eat it because I know where it comes from. I know what, uh, there's also a lot of chemicals and hormones that go into meat these days. Chickens, for example, are manufactured at an alarming rate. And uh, how they're produced like that, we're then ingesting what the hormones and the chemicals that are being pumped into them. So, you know, that is enough of my little spiel. I was asked to mention it. So, Kirst, there you have it. I hope I didn't break Twitter with my discussion. I'm not judging anyone out there. There are a number of documentaries and things you can watch that will give you some really shocking information about what goes on in the world. Really, really crazy stuff. Wow. First time Kirsten's been quiet in my ear. Hey, Seb. Normally she's at least got something to say, Kirst. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, South Africa's got a pretty decent meat industry, I suppose, but on the global scheme of things, you know, my mom was uh, what you call a baby boomer, so born after the Second World War, and, you know, they ate meat once a month back in those days, because there was no meat available after the war, the world was in a very interesting place, and nowadays, people complain if you don't have meat with one meal. I mean, even doing a meat-free day a week, there's huge complaints. I think we tried it here, and there was almost a, it was almost a revolution, almost a mutiny. Uh, we eat meat three times a day. Some people more, four times a day. X-Ranger is being cheeky, I think. It says that carrots only die when they're in your stomach. Well, plants were designed to be eaten. And a lot of the fruits and things and seeds are designed to be eaten so as to distribute their seed. Um, I don't think any animal was designed to be eaten so as to distribute their seed. But, you know, in nature, there's a, there's a tendency to, to overanalyze these things. But when it's sustainable and uh, when you can grow it yourself and you can provide for it yourself and be accountable for the waste that not only you produce but the animals themselves produce, then I've got no problem with it. But um, there are some shocking scientific papers out there which talk about what the the pollution is doing to the the rivers doing to the estuaries doing to the environment and uh, the Amazon jungle is being chopped down so as to produce food to grow food to feed to livestock to ever-increasing population with an ever-increasing demand for meat there we go that's the end of my discussion from bearing in mind I didn't bring it up <laughs> Did I, Seb? No. no. Romit, um, you want to know if leopards get stressed? I think most animals that live out here in the wild have are, are under a co constant state of alertness and awareness. Um, I think there's adrenaline, definitely, that builds up in them. I don't think you could call it stress. I think they, because they don't, stress is, is a mental thing we build on it it's all about thought it's all about not letting something go something that happens to you now uh, leopards and most animals out here will invariably in a very short space of time let go of those thoughts and so that kind of it leaves them alone a very good sort of idea to think about is when you have ducks in a pond uh, one male duck comes in from the right one from the left they have a bit of a territorial dispute they fight with each other and then they they, they, they go off in different directions, they flap their wings, they let go of the adrenaline, and then they're at peace again. But what happens with humans is in a non-stop battle, he said this to me, work is doing that to me, and we're constantly taking past events and putting them into the present moment and living in the past, living in the future, deadlines, and so that is where stress comes from. It's all thought-based, um, and we don't, the adrenaline builds up in us as well, and we don't let it go. We don't let it go. Sometimes I think you should, everyone out there, if you feel a little bit stressed or overwhelmed, just stand up from your chair, do a few jumping jacks, jumps in the air, and sit down again, and you'll feel a lot better because you're letting go of all that adrenaline build up inside of you, which is all being de sort of developed from your brain, from the flight or fight mechanisms that we all as animals have, you know, but we are not learning how to let it go. So that builds up into stress. That's why exercise is so important. People who exercise feel so much better about themselves because they're able to let go of a lot of that sort of anxiety and negative energy within themselves through 
physical bodily function um, running away from it I suppose letting it all go so I don't think animals feel stressed up the one animal I would say that definitely shows signs of stress is elephants uh, when something happens within the herd an immediate response is their temporal glands start to secrete um, that can happen as a response to food scarcity uh, demanding youngsters or even immediately if something happens within the herd that stresses them you can see those temporal glands secreting straight away and um, I don't know if they hold on to it or if they let it go but it's important to let it go flap your wings and glide off peacefully well let's go and see mr. James Hendry has not on the ground anymore he's high in the tree let's see if he's stressed about falling again No, I'm very relaxed about falling. I probably shouldn't be, but I am. I'm in this marula tree. Uh, you might say to yourself, why did he climb this marula tree? Well, the answer is to my left-hand side. I've come to see if there's a leopard in this tree. But I don't think there is. Now, many of you will have seen this carcass before, I suspect. I have not seen it before. It is an impala carcass. That was in, put in this tree, obviously, by a male leopard, I think. And it was then left before complete. And obviously is hanging by its skin. There are ants all over it, which is quite interesting. <laughs> Luke, who is obviously sitting in the final control, says, this is what happens when you can't climb out of a tree. So basically, I could like, look like this in about two months' time <laughs> if I'm unable to climb out of the tree. Yes, thank you for that, Luke. But what is, what's interesting is that uh, the decomposition that's taken place. So obviously, the leopard's decided he's eaten enough and he's gone away. He's left a bit of the intercostal tissue, the tissue between the ribs. That's the kind of stuff you eat when you go to a steakhouse and you have ribs. And he's left the spine, obviously. He's eaten, in fact, very little of the ribs, which is unusual. And he's left no meat on the hindquarters. So the coccyx are entirely free of any meat, as are the forequarters. There's nothing in the skull. And so everything is completely dry. Ants are taking the last of what there is here, and the sun will probably do the rest. But what is also fascinating to me is that I think there is something else, some other kind of uh, bone-eating organism has had a go at the head, and it looks like termites. Now, I don't know if termites eat calcium. I've not seen that before. But I don't know if you can see, but the termites, at least the activity on the head, looks very similar to the activity that you'd see on a dead branch that was near some termites. So it's been eaten away by something or other, and whatever it is is not there anymore. And I wonder if that wasn't termites, maybe. He's certainly not looking in good shape, this impala. I don't think he could be revived. Anyway, I thought we'd just pop up here and have a look at him. The skin is still on the legs. There's quite a lot in the way of, uh, at least very little in the way of hair, but there's still quite a lot of skin. And everything is quite hard, and I will tell you that it still smells fairly offensive. Robert, uh, you say bring it down for the tent? No, I'm not going to try and bring this thing down. Uh, it's just simply too smelly, I'm afraid. I don't really want to touch it at all. We could probably bring it down, but I'm not going to try. I think all we'd have to do is take this bit of skin over here and then pull it around a branch. But I'm not going to do that. I don't wish to touch the skin in the slightest. All right, now for the dismount. Of course, it's never very easy. And normally, as is happening now, Kirsten likes to do the dismount live. She thinks it's quite amusing. I'll try not to make it too amusing. <laughs> the trick is going to be getting my arms onto this particular piece here. Oh, 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 there we go. We're okay now. A 
Kirsten says I guess a 6 out of 10. Emma <coughs> gives me 5.5. <coughs> Luke gave me a 7. He says out of pity. What did you give me? 10. 10. Thank you, Senzel. <laughs> Luke, you can maybe be my friend. You two foul redheads in the final control and consider yourselves without me as a friend from now on. I'm sure they're all very upset about that. Thank you, Malake. You say I'm not going to impress too many girls that way. Well, uh, I mean, I wish I had evidence to show otherwise, but I don't, so maybe you're correct. Thank you very much. Perhaps that's been my problem all along. <laughs> all right, let's carry on, see if we can... <laughs> And Daniel from Scotland gave me a zero out of ten for my dismount. Good grief. I must confess, I feel like I'm taking a couple of hits here this morning. We will now continue to find Tingana, and we definitely won't show it to anybody when we find him, because clearly there are a number of you that don't deserve it. j Dog says, what for effort? E for effort. Oh, so I got an E. It was obviously a very dreadful dismount, the fact that uh, so many people are now pillorying me on social media. I really think that that's very unfortunate. Some of you are saying 10 out of 10, thank you. I'm just not hearing about those. I'm only hearing about those who clearly dislike me. Right, well, on we go. To those of you who have given me less than 9 out of 10, when we find Tingana, I ask that you close your eyes. The leopards seem to be up. They dismount and climb better than I do, apparently, so why don't you go and look at them? Yeah, well, Talamba was looking like she was going to go up the tree, and uh, now she's gone back and annoyed Mum again. <laughs> Got Mum by the throat. There we go. Sorry, we're not going to move, folks. I'm pretty sure they're going to come out now into the open and maybe go up the tree. Now she gives Mum a bit of a, a bit of a wet kiss on the back of the head. She's definitely keen to go up the youngster. She was looking at the tree, eyeing it, but maybe she's waiting for Mum's permission. There we go. The stick moved. Let me get it. Let me take out the stick. <laughs> Yeah, she's up again. I wonder if she's going up. She's definitely interested. You can see her eyes. Look at that. The intention. You might be lucky now to see her physically climb the tree. If she's hungry enough, that is. Or maybe she wants some grass instead. Much easier to get at the grass. It's quite low down. A little bit of a belly on her. She's going to sit right behind the tree again, isn't she? There she is. There she is. Well, I'm just going to... Just put the clutch in and just move forward an inch. There you got it. Sarah, good question. I mean, leopard females become reproductive at about two-ish, maybe a little bit after two, two and a half, maybe three. Uh, for example, Shadulu, who's around, she's about four, they reckon, and she's apparently pregnant, so potentially potentially having her first um, cubs soon. Just stand by, someone is calling me. Standing by. Good thanks on yourself, Abel. You're welcome, welcome to make your way. Okay, so someone's gonna come and join us in the sighting. So you're gonna hear a vehicle soon, but let's watch the lumber getting active again as she gets very excited to try and attack her mother. She's now sneaking around the back. Where's she gone? Disappeared into the long grass. We might see her explode out there in a blur of spots. She comes very delicately. Abel, I'm to your right. Now just go back 20 meters and take a right. You'll see the track. Okay, 
here. So we've got someone joining us, just trying to guide him in here. You keep watching that leopard cub. And she, there she goes. Yeah, Abel, just come straight in with your nose. Uh, you'll see them. They're on the opposite bank from where we are. She's not as interested in stalking mum now. Is she getting hungry? And she looks up the tree again. Cheryl, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's possible that, you know, because leopard cubs, females, or leopard females will stay close to their sort of natal area, they get quite familiar with an area, and potentially they were even born in the same sort of drainage den site area. So they're quite familiar with the ins and outs and the trees and the area. And so if they do have the den site there, they can quite easily find it back, find their way back again after, you know, an extensive period of hunting. No problem. Um, and maybe that's one of the reasons why females will do that. So I think th through experience, they might find better den sites. Uh, they might use the right cover, the right sort of angle. Let me just, sorry, I'm just trying to call Abel in. You can come straight down here, Abel. She's just on the left there. So, um, for example, drainage line like this, where, where there's adequate trees and ag adequate cover, is a very good area for, for a leopard to den. But obviously she has to move that periodically so as to keep fresh and away because obviously the smell of her and any kill that she has and the cub obviously starts to linger and the hyena will find them. She's coming around. Is she going to stalk mum? The baby's there. Sorry, sorry about any signal breakup, folks. We haven't moved. Why are we maybe back a centimetre or two to get the gremlins out the way? Let's go back over to Taylor. Hello, I feel like it's been so long since I last saw you all. Mary and I are just trying to keep nice and warm now because the sun is amazing. And my eyes are watering because the sun is so nice. Oh, so great. Kirsten wants me to show you all a magic trick, but she didn't want to come to me earlier when I was prepared, preparing to do the magic trick. So now I'm, I'm uncertain if I should do the magic trick. Shall I do the magic trick? Kirsty, can we do a poll to decide? Okay, we are now going to do a poll on, on Twitter. Let's just see how many of you are awake. And if I get more than 70% votes, yes, then I shall do the magic trick. If I know, you know what, 80% because I think I'm worth it. <laughs> if I don't get 80% votes saying yes to do the magic trick, then it doesn't get done. Then we'll have to save it for another time. So let's see. Vote on Twitter, of course. That is where the poll will be, be done, is on Twitter. Unfortunately, not on YouTube. Now we see. So we're just bumbling around. We're going to head sort of towards the west now. I haven't. I don't think actually anyone's been down there. <laughs> I'm sure the roads will still be nice and fresh. We can see who's come onto the property, although I haven't seen any tracks except just hyena tracks going south. All of them going far south. Excuse me, hot bell. Excuse me. Do you like not want to fly? Do you want to be in, do you want to be on the show? Obviously this hornbill does not want to leave us, so we will view the hornbill. That's my magic trick. See how I disappeared. Ha 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 ha. There it is. Hello, red billed hornbill. Oh. Okay, amazing. So you got 88% yes for the magic trick. And for those of you, the eight of you that voted no, you can't watch. You've got to turn your screen off. And uh, you you won't be allowed to watch this. <laughs> <laughs> You're so mean. Why did you do that? I believe no, and I look like a fool now because it wasn't even an option to say no. No, I wanted to see. I wanted to see who was going to say no, who wasn't interested. Okay, I'll do it now. I'm just trying to find this best spot. Do we have to do it? 
Okay, I'm just trying to think. Do you think not so great? But that's what should we see? Because I'm worried that the, the, it's see-through if we have the sun. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? In fr I don't know. Let's just check. Let's see if this is going to work. <laughs> Guys, I'm not a magician. I'm just letting you all know. Why are there birds alarming? Some birdies shouting here. Okay, Ferg? Can you see me? Repositioning is needed. I'm not going to plug my earpiece in just there. We have to do it this way. Okay, just quickly do the test once more. Is that better? Yeah. For those of you that go into the interweb just as much as I do, you would see that there's a trend at the moment. Have you all seen that trend? Where everybody's been disappearing behind a blanket and um, in front of their dogs and cats. And, well, it's, it's pretty hilarious to see the the reaction of these animals. I kind of wish we had dogs at home so that because uh, that's what I would do. I'm now going to attempt this trick. Ferg is going to have to pretend to be the dog or the cat and we will get his reaction. I'm nervous. I <laughs> With your fluffy hat that you've got on, you could be a beagle. <laughs> okay. Are you ready? One, two, Simbalabim! <laughs> Was it a terrible attempt, Ferg? Was it not the best? Shall I try again? Shall I try again? Let me see if I can get this right. I've got to practice here so that I can go home. Okay. One, two, sin salabim. No, that one got... That, I'm done. Was it a good one? That one got caught on my foot and then I pulled... Yeah. Earlier it was much better because we had the wind in our favor, so it, the, my kokoi was not getting attached to my body. And I wasn't standing out and things like that. Anyways, I'll pra keep practicing. Maybe, maybe someone can call their dog if you've got... Kirsten is now not impressed with the trick. Well, you didn't want to come to me earlier when I wanted to do it and I had all the things in my favor. Like I said, the wind was very important. It's your fault, Kirsty, that I couldn't do that trick. It's all your fault. Now, everyone's gonna think I'm an amateur because of you. <laughs> the good news wants a refund. What did you pay in the first place? Peanuts. <laughs> this is a free show. <laughs> I said to you, you could turn it off. You go, go do something else. There was a disclaimer. There was a warning that it was probably going to be terrible. <laughs> ah, okay, I'll keep practicing. I'll practice in front of my mom while she is... I don't know what my mom will be doing, but we'll practice. No, I'm, I went, no, no, I will see my folks. My folks, yeah, probably drinking wine. Yes, Kirsten. <laughs> That's not exactly what, what my mother will be doing. So, because I'm going to Cape Town, so I had a choice of a holiday. I had to choose between potentially heading down to Durban to maybe go and see the Durban July on the big horse race or Cape Town, but I think Cape Town's gonna to be lots and lots of fun. So I'm going to do that instead and have, I can't wait to eat seafood. Oh, yum. Uh, now James, of course, is copying me. He's so unoriginal. <laughs> Let's go across to him. Apparently he's also gonna take his chance at being a magician. I know she's accused me of being unoriginal, but there are faults to being too original. For example, going to Cape Town on holiday in the winter in an order to be original rather than going in the summer when everyone else comes, it, well, it's just silly because, of course, the weather is so foul. Before I do my magic trick... Herbie's just looking for Tingana. Let's quickly do this magic trick. Do you see this leaf? Do you see the leaf, everybody? A normal leaf? 
You can see both sides of the leaf. It is an amazing leaf. Do you see it? Okay. Now, I'm going to make it disappear. Where could it have gone? Oh, my goodness! Here it is! Exactly the same leaf in my pocket. That is amazing! <sighs> Wasn't that amazing? What a spectacular magic trick! I just learned how to do that. Senzo taught me how to do it. It was amazing. Tell me that was a better magic trick than Taylor's. <laughs> Let's go and see what Herbie has to say up here. He was whistling for us, which makes me think that Tingana was probably standing on this termite mound. Ah, he thinks there's a warthog. Okay, we think that Tingana was probably hunting here on this termite mound. Let's go this way around, Sinzo. Certainly a leopard has been active here at some stage. This block seems to be full of termite mounds that pigs like to hang around in. Will you make it under? The reason we're going around this way is that obviously there is a hole in that termite mound in which there could be pigs, and we don't want to be run over by them. Thank you very much for all of you appreciating my fantastic Warthogs. Okay. Right. Come over here, everybody. Ah, yes. You can see he was lying over here. You can see there from the way the earth has been scuffed about the place and waiting for some warthogs to come out here. He may even have caught one. See here? He would have been waiting there, patiently looking over the top here. And then moved down there, yeah. Herbert says, shot down that way. Here's the warthog burrow. You can see lots of fresh activity over there. What do you think, Herbie? Herbie says he definitely chased one of these pigs, whether he caught one or not. Well, just look around, we need to check around here. Be very careful that we don't disturb him too much. But he could easily be sitting close by with a dead warthog. Alright, Senzo, you go just a little bit further that way. I'm sending Senzo around the hole, not too close to it, because of course he has the backpack on. And so should Mummy Warthog come exploding out of there? Yes, that's exactly where you shouldn't be, attached to a tree. If Mummy Warthog comes out, you're going to be deeply afraid. So will I. All right, we're going to circle around this termite mound and see if we don't pick something up. In the meantime, uh, Taylor... What's that chap's name? Never mind. No... Taylor Copperfield has got a bird for you. <laughs> well, James, you really failed there, hey? <laughs> we lost our bird, but thank you very much for trying to be funny. It's, uh, it was spectacular. It really worked. We did have a beautiful sighting of a gymnogene. <laughs> Let me go forward and see if we can find it again. Ah. Oh, James. Okay, let's keep searching. It's in, it, I think it's just around the corner. I didn't see it fly off too far. So I think it's just on its uh, on its next perch. Oh, there it goes. Are you going to land? 
Okay, I think I still... No, there's quarry trees everywhere. I'm just going to get up ahead. So I'm just trying to keep my eye on it. Okay, I've seen it. Hopefully the light will improve as well because we're straight into the sun. So stunning. Beautiful. Well, at least we got a glimpse of it. Darling wasn't very happy about that. Okay, bye, Jimna Jean. African Harry Hawk. I bet some of you were excited to have a quick glimpse of that. It's always nice. I think it's off hunting. It's definitely looking for something to eat. What are you going to look for? Looking for some chicks. I wonder. I don't think I can see it anymore. I'm, I'm, have we got it? Oh, there, there, there. I see it now. Um, I think here might be a gap. Yeah. We'll just keep going. I'm a little bit further away now, which should help too. I'm just going to go over this little bump. Goop, goop, goop. Next gap. There we go. And we've got perfect light now. There it is. Hello. There are very interesting looking birds, but not wanting to hang around for us. It keeps flying off to the next tree. Oh well. We tried. We tried. We tried. Moving on. Where are we going to go and look now? I don't know where we're going to go. We just keep going this way, I think. Mm. It's very quiet down this end. I haven't even seen that many in Parlour, which there normally are quite a few of. Find Jim No Jean. Yeah. He's gonna fly. That's, he's flying because of us. We'll leave him alone now. We're not anywhere near him, but he's definitely reacting to us, so we will move on and let it carry on with its day in search of some delicious treats that are maybe hidden away in the trunks of the trees. I'm glad you think so, Annette. It was okay. It wasn't the best Gymnogene no sighting I think I've ever had in my life. Um, it was all right. It's just a, not happy with us. Sometimes they relax. We were quite far away, but I mean, it is a bird. But um, hopping from tree to tree every time, it's sort of, we come around and stop and it flies off. So we'll leave it. We shall let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Get that song stuck in your head now. I think that's how it goes. I also, I don't know all the so words to the songs of Frozen, unfortunately. When you're stuck out in the bush and you don't have any children, it's easy not to catch on to that trend, as you can imagine. Come on, warthog. That'd be nice to see. I haven't seen pigs in a while. Well, I have, but it's normally just been their bottoms disappearing. Off into the distance. Who is walking here? Somebody was walking. Now he's starting to see a few more tracks. Like, maybe we'll bump into a herd of impala or something along those lines. Ah, I know Steve has been battling with the gremlins this morning. But let's uh, go and see if he's managed to fight them off. Yes, well, hopefully you can see what we can see because a little Tlalumba has climbed up the Tumbuati tree and is now enjoying herself a little bit of a meal, albeit it gets stuck in the teeth from time to time. Yum, yum, yum. Tundi is still at the base of the tree. It was quite fun watching her climb up. She did it quite well, I'll be honest with you. Kukumuri could learn a thing or two from little Tlalamba. He is very awkward in his tree climbing capabilities. <laughs> we will see with some evidence of that on this afternoon's Safari Lives, which will feature not only Hukumuri, but plenty of activity from this little one. Of course, they have been the stars of the show this week. Tandi and her tlalamba. 
and obviously there's always a warthog and a daker that feature <laughs> in the show don't they Seb although they don't get the recognition that they deserve Tama eh? you could just see how Kalamba responded there to to someone moving in the sighting it's a beautiful view isn't it Look, there's another vehicle. She's looking at them quite deliberately. You can see the intention, can't you? She's going to calm down and start feeding again. Here we go. Almost like she shook it off, whatever it is that her mind was trying to tell her. And then the mind goes back to feeding. So that's the thing with wild animals is that their intentions are always very clear. There we go. She's like, what are you talking about me again? <laughs> their intentions are always very clear. They don't pretend. They're not sneaky like us. Uh oh, if she plays with that, she's going to drop it. She's going to drop it. Yes, she is. Mum has done such a good job, Columbra, of securing that for you in the tree. Why are you trying to play with your food now? Well, it's a lesson that a leopard needs to learn that a kill that's not secured in a tree is up for grabs for anyone on the ground. But at least it's good to see that she's feeding in the tree. Uh oh. There we go. Oh, oh, that weighs more than I thought it did, Mum. But it's also some a little bit of practice for her to reposition the kill up the tree. Because um, that would be, you know, first things first, obviously. Being able to take something up the tree is one thing. But being able to position it up there and secure it in the nook of a tree. Oh, she's done quite well. I think she didn't intend to do what she's done, but she's well and truly wedged it in the, the fork of the tree there. So some practice required, you know, rather start practicing with the kill already up in a tree because getting it up there is a difficult task, especially when it probably weighs about the same as you do. You can see the Dacre's uh, eye is very close in that swollen preorbital gland just underneath the eye. That is what the Dacre uses for territorial marking. Quite interesting to see that the lumber is pretty much the same size as the meat she's moving around so I wonder how many of you out there could move around a piece of meat that is as big as you dead weight very difficult very very difficult I mean what did we say the other day Seb about being a dad called dad strength eh? <laughs> if you've got a child mom or dad know what mom or dad strength is all about you're able to hold that child almost for, well, for very long periods of time. But picking up something that is dead weight, that is equivalent to your weight, is not an easy task. And uh, she is doing it while perched precariously up in the tree. Now she's going to try and go the other side and see if she can pull it out of her little... <laughs> where it's caught. What is she going to do there? This is funny to watch how she figures this out. Just... Trying to get a look at what Tundi's doing right now. <laughs> now she's using her weight. Try and pull it down. <laughs> oh. Oh, she's coming down the tree again. We're not in the best angle to be able to see that because uh, if we do move, we're probably going to lose signal again. Oh, she's going to go up again, not finished, analysing it from the bottom. Okay, she's had a good look. Okay, there we go. Katrina, yes indeed, they are they have very strong neck muscles, but pound for pound with a strong cat, because they're able to take uh, prey animals that are almost twice their weight up a tree in their jaws, so that requires not just strength in the jaw, the neck, but also in the, the legs and the entire body. Very, very powerful animals. And uh, she is building that strength now, being able to also precariously perch on a very narrow branch and move that dead weight around. She's not quite sure what to do now. 
she looked down at mum to say like mum can you help and mum's kind of looking up going you you put it there just don't drop it figure out what to do next and she will she'll figure it out She's still got plenty of time so special the last time I saw the lumber in a tree um, was with you Seb that time when the steenbok when she couldn't feed it up in the tree the time when I fell in the hole I remember yeah, he remembers that clearly he was trying to rack his brains about when we saw her up the tree but remembering the time we fell in the hole is much easier to remember <laughs> but Tlalamba was incapable of feeding in the tree at that time and that was before I went on leave so that's probably about two months ago month and a half ago somewhere around there she was incapable of feeding in the tree Tony kept having to take the kill up and down obviously down for her to feed and then up again when she was finished she's coming down now or oh, what is she doing maybe she's gonna have another little look no she not quite sure not quite sure okay well from our cat James has got something with a similar name but far more hairy Here's a schnauzer. I've got a schnauzer here. This is the schnauzer caterpillar. I'm just trying to help you. Stop shouting at me, Senzel. Senzel shouting at me, everybody. It'd be very nasty. I'm trying to show you why it's called a schnauzer. Okay, Senzel, zoom out. One second. I'm just going to break him off. And then we'll put him back on the tree, everybody, I promise. Okay, there we go. Oh, there's no need for you to shout at me anymore. You can see his face there is that of the schnauzer. See? You see his face there? Yes, my favorite dog, the schnauzer. Not. But most importantly, I think, if I tilt him like this, look how the it looks like little drops of silver and gold have been placed all the way down his back. Isn't that amazing? I really find the colors of this schnauzer caterpillar quite something. It looks like something, you know, a young kid with no idea of biology might put on a coloring in book or a, a I don't know, plasticine model of a caterpillar, gold and silver. If you saw that on a child's design you'd say well he's got a good imagination but he'll never see anything like that in nature he's also got um <laughs> not to put too fine a point on it he's got a golden ring around his bottom there we go you see that from <laughs> sitting on his throne says Kirsten <laughs> yes possibly so that is the beautiful Schnauzer caterpillar. Now we've come back to the termite mound where we saw that Tingana had been hunting. We didn't, we went to another two or three termite mounds, didn't find any further activity from him, so now we've come back to the original one. We'll still pop around here for a little while. I've got that feeling that we're not going to find him. I've got the feeling that he's seen us and he's just kind of slunk away. Like I say, he doesn't like to be seen on foot. Anyway, we might be lucky. We'll keep trying until the end of our drive. Schnauzer, there you are. Some squirrels alarm calling. Come on then, let's continue. Herbert went up this way. And there are so many caterpillars out here that uh, I don't know, you know, I don't, can't identify as moth or butterfly, and Sean, that's one of them. I don't know what that's going to become. A, it might not become anything because, it's, of course, it's operating in the middle of winter, which is not a good time for caterpillars generally, for any insects, really. So it might become neither. But I really don't know. And, you know, the beautiful butterfly app that I have on my phone doesn't have the larva or the larvae. 
and so it's very difficult to tell whether that will become a caterpillar or a moth. I suspect a moth. They tend to be hairier in my experience, but I might be wrong. They tend to be hairier than the caterpillars, at least than the butterflies. I see him. I see Herberto. We'll catch up with him, get an update, and while we do that, we'll go back to Stiva Volvo, 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 and his leopards. Yes, well, Tandy's head is up purely because the little salamba has moved off a little bit. We can see, I can basically just make her out as she's disappearing a little bit further away, and the worrisome mother's just making sure everything is okay. She came down the tree with a very nice dismount after re securing her dacre in a much more accessible position, I suppose. Costa, yes, indeed they do. Tandy actually stood up earlier and did a bit of a scent mark scratching. Ooh. What's she doing? <laughs> I think Lalamba tried to catch a squirrel. You can hear a squirrel going absolutely crazy. I heard all sorts of scratching, scratch marks happening over there. <laughs> and the squirrel, I don't know if you can hear it, go absolutely ballistic. Just in the thickets over there. You can't hear it, it's a little bit far off. There's a hornbill shouting. Sunday's gone to go investigate what exactly has happened, but it's possible that the lumber has made a kill. <laughs> Squirrels are not happy. They're not happy at all. But females will also soar and scent mark. Yeah, she's coming back down there, Seb, just in that little gap. Yeah, punch in there. Just coming down through there. There she is, bottom of the screen. Yeah. She's come back. Has she got anything in her mouth? No, nope. she missed. <laughs> Squirrels are not very happy with anything that just happened there. Mum went to go and find out. Maybe to go and be a proud mother and see, did you catch something, my youngster? And maybe to congratulate her if she did. But yes, leopards will send Mark. I was surprised she stood up and, and started scratching the ground right where she'd been standing. Um, have you got it there, Seb? Just to the right, I think. Oh, you've got it. Okay. And, um, but they will also call. They will also soar. Their, their call's a bit longer than that of the males. But a very similar sort of process. Females defend territories against other females, and males defend territories against other males. And the males' territories generally encompass about three or so females. So much larger, much bigger. And their scent marking is also to advertise their reproductivity to males moving through. Probably can't hear it, but all the, the bush is alive now with alarm calls. The squirrels have realized there's been a leopard here the whole time and we didn't know it. <laughs> the hornbills are shouting, where did that come from? They've been so camouflaged here and there we go, they camouflaged again. Tundi's disappeared. The lumber's moved off to the right. Can you see her tail? Just the tail. <laughs> Small, naughty leopard cub stalking it. <laughs> if he had pants, he'd probably be changing it right now. Just heard her. Just heard Anyala. Anyala just barked off to the side here. There's Nyala's barking. They've spotted Tandy. She's probably gone for a drink. Jillian, you want to know if Columba's able to look after herself now? I mean, to a degree, um, I don't think she'd be able to feed enough for herself. H how long she'd be able to survive if Tandy disappeared is very hard to say. Very hard to say. I think she might be a bit young. Okay, well, the Nyala are alarm calling. I don't know if she's going to hunt. I'm sure she's just going to go and have a drink. We might try and go through there and have a look. A little bit difficult where we are now. There's one road in the house that we kind of blocked up ahead. Okay, well, while we try and figure out what to do next, let's go over to Taylor, who's busy driving. 
and listening. I'm trying to do both. I can hear a squirrel shouting, but I don't trust it. Stop lying! Shout that to the squirrel. It's talking nonsense. There's not even anything there. Right. Uh, <laughs> I have not driven Gauri cut line, even though I've said I was going to drive that road about 10 times today, so I suppose we might as well drive it. I've just done another loop around Galago, Galago Pan, all those areas. There's still no leopard tracks coming out, so we know Tengan is in there. He has to be, otherwise we would have seen his footprints, unless he decided to leap across the road, which also put him put a put. me try that all again. I wouldn't put it past him. As sure what I was just trying to say. Oh goodness, it's going to be one of those days. I think I'll have to go back to bed and have a nap. That's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to eat so much breakfast and then I'm going to go and do my voiceovers today because remember we've got Safari Lives later this afternoon. And then I'm going to sleep. Run. Can't come and ask for me today. I'm unavailable, unfortunately. I'm gonna put a, I'm gonna put a big sign on that it says "Do not disturb." Hibernation in process, or maybe estivation. Just a little short period of time. Oh, uh, Ramit, I don't know. You know, it's happiness, so it could be anything. Ferg, have you got an inkling as to what uh, what could be for breakfast? anything i think however there will be some form of oh you know what i'm really craving can i tell you what i'm craving ah for some reason today i want comfort food i want pasta there's a giraffe i would like a carbonara would be great with extra bacon and mushrooms and all the cheesy cheesiness and <laughs> there we go hello giraffe that looks like a tree what's wrong with your neck why does he look like he's got a big old kink in it? Where's my binoculars? Does, is it just me or does he look crooked? The perfect heart pattern? Oh, okay, Kirsty and I are looking at two different things. Yes, there is a heart shape thing on his, or patch on his neck. However, he just looks like he's fairly crooked, but perhaps it's just the way that he's staying, uh, not staying, standing. He, he is an exceptional fella. He's got a very, very thick neck. I'm sure this is one of the giraffe we have been seeing. He just looks a little bit crooked. Stand up straight. Oh, that's another thing my mother does when she bosses me. Classic bossy Donna. Put your shoulders back. <laughs> Stop hunching. As soon as I walk through the door, I, you know, get mommed. Anyways, I can't wait for Sunday. <laughs> can't wait for tomorrow afternoon, late in the afternoon when I arrive back in Johannesburg. And then I can go, here's my washing, Mom, I need it by tomorrow because I'm going to Cape Town. <laughs> oh, she loves it when I do that. Giraffe, do you ever take washing home to your mum? Nope, that's because you don't see your mum anymore, very sadly. Crystal, you said that the giraffe looks like a bendy, twirly straw. I don't know if you can drink from it, though. It just does, he does look bizarre. I don't know if the way he's arching his neck, I have absolutely no idea what's going on with that. You're a bit bent out of the shape. Perhaps it's time you visit the chiropractor. Any giraffe chiropractors out there? I know you get chiropractors for horses. But I don't know if you can get a giraffe chiropractor. How would you, how would a chiropractor click a giraffe back into place? That would be great. Any chiropractors out there that have suggestions? Who knows? It's very peaceful here, though. Except for the birds that are alarming around me. But I don't think that they're alarming at a leopard. I think they might just be chattering. Chattering about, perhaps also talking about the giraffe with a crooked neck. But he's very calm. Oh, why are those birds shouting? Sorry, I'm just listening in, off in the distance. I don't know if you'd be able to hear it. It's quite far away. I'm trying to work out if it's anything serious or if it's just the old bush telegraph. I did almost think that this giraffe was a tree at one point, though. It's, he's so dark. He's so beautiful now. That, of course, comes with age, and typically only if you're a male, you become nice and dark. And that's sort of with all the species. You see it quite nicely in lions as well. 
No, love with faith. He's actually standing up. The reason why we can't see him is because he's in the, in one of the drainage systems. This is actually this used to be the favourite um, area of the Nkuhumas. There were lots of buffalo around here, and if you walk through here, it's like a graveyard. There's just buffalo carcass after buffalo carcass. And I think at one point the Nkuhumas. I think for the first six months of my time at Wild Earth, the uh, the Nkuhuma Pride Alliance just um, yeah basically bounced between Voyatella Dam and Buffalsook Dam. So straight behind that giraffe is you'll eventually get to Bifflesook Dam and that's where I used to spend a lot of time so it's so just a bit of a depression but I can see why because he almost looks short but he isn't if I were to drive on down in there Ferg would hurt his neck having to look up I'd also hurt my neck having to look up Oh, that's nice. I just did a big old stretch. <laughs> Isn't there? There's nothing quite as um, as awesome as a stretch, eh? And two uh, two ox peckers. I love a big stretch. They're so great. Three ox peckers. I couldn't make a sound when I stretched, Kirsten, because I'm at work, so I had to do a silent stretch. But yes, normally normally sounds are associated with with good stretching. You know, well, so I try sometimes to be professional here, yeah? sometimes. You've all seen how I have to try and hide a yawn. That's always funny. The face that you pull when you're trying to hide a yawn. I sort of do the similar face. Oh, no, now I'm talking about yawning. Don't yawn, Taylor, don't. Don't do it. I couldn't hold it in. <laughs> Sorry. That was a great one. My eyes are now watering. Again, it's I'm in the sun. I promise you, if you had to link away from me, there'd be a problem because we're going to would just go straight to sleep. We're in the most amazing spot. Maybe that giraffe is getting some sun on the back of its head and it's enjoying the warmth. It is very warm, though, when you sit still, but it's it's still a bit chilly when you when you get going again. Okay, giraffe, we're going to go, though. Bye. Thanks so much. Have a lovely day. We'll see you next time. I might not go anyway because I can't get the car in reverse. Now, I haven't got a clue what's going to be for breakfast. I'm going to try and think about it now, and I'll tell you when you come back to me. But let's go to James and see if he can guess. No, I can't, but I can tell you that a member of my party is currently mid-breakfast. Senzor has hanging out of his mouth a granola bar of some description. Is it nice, Senzor? It's not nice. Looking forward to proper breakfast, are you? Yeah. You can swallow now. No. Okay. What we've got here is a sneezewood tree. We've given up on Tingana, so I'm going to show you the sneezewood tree. Identifiable, of course, by the, well, compound leaves. And they really are fairly unmistakable. And then if you break off a piece, and you smell it, as Steph always likes to say, it smells like those cheap cheese necks or cheese chips with the basically largely made of monosodium glutamate and various other things that will give you diseases. Yeah, the, the newer shoots don't smell quite like that. But that's what it is. Sneezewood, Terozygum oblicum, I think that's the name. Tangana, I suspect, saw us in that block. We're heading home now. And, you know, he doesn't like to be seen on foot, as I said, so I says it would have been very easy for him to hide in there, so he would have just slunk away into the grass. The breakfast has now gone into the mouth entirely and will shortly be chewed. OK, so we're heading down one of these tributaries that feeds eventually into the dam in front of uh, Vuyatela, in front of the dam camp. There are four of them, and they all converge, basically, on that dam. And it's a really pretty place to walk through here because you go up and down through these little dry river beds and, you know, you never know what you're going to find, obviously. But it's a dreadful place to try and drive in here because there's a lot of thick bush. And you can see the animals quite enjoy it as well. Here's a little path. Well, one of the things we're hoping to do, Jen, is walk upon a lion pride. It would be great if we walked upon a lion pride. Uh, that's not because I'm into extreme sports and being terrified, but because a lion pride normally, Jen, will get up and move away. That's what they do. They don't really like to uh, hang around people. If they were on a kill and with youngsters, well, they may charge. It would be very unusual for them to do that, though. They may give us a growl and then move away. Uh, the chances of us actually coming to any harm 
or having to defend ourselves very slim. Very, very slim. Otherwise you wouldn't do this. Here's a bigger sneeze wood. Ow, 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 ow. That was a piece of that was a piece of Zizifus bush. Okay, here's a here's a bigger sneeze wood. And that would probably smell probably smell like if you scrape it it'll smell like the cheese. Yeah, there it is. Have you smelled it before? Let me get my knife out for you. I've got a knife today, everybody. I think I've got a knife. I do. Fantastic. Defend myself from Biltong. There you go. Smell that, Senzel. You want me to hold the camera for you? Yeah, you can do it. Yeah. Yes? Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> I imagine the picture of Senzel's selfie smelling there must have been pretty impressive. So that's the sneezewood. So it was like an obligum. If you can find a straight stick, excellent for walking sticks, but it does grow at a very squiffy angle. Uh, Monique, no, the smell of it doesn't make you sneeze. I don't know why it's called a sneeze wood, actually. Um, I, sus I really have no idea. I feel stupid now because I I'm, why have I never asked the question as to why it's called a sneeze wood? I don't know. It's a very good question to which I do not have an answer. This plant here, we're on to plants now because there's nothing else to look at, is called the num num. And this is the forest num num or Carissa bispinosa, called bispinosa because it's got two spines on it. Oh, yeah, thorn. No, they're spines. They're not thorns. And it's got, I think, the second best smelling flower in all of the bush felt. The first being the gardenia, this being the second. This is the forest num num. Carissa bispinosa. Come on, Senzel. Breakfast isn't going to eat itself. Oh, okay. So Luke, who's uh, obviously very adept at doing various things, including googly, I think it's a googly he's used, has said that the sneeze wood is so called because of the oil when you cut it. Uh, if it gets into your nostrils, it will make you sneeze. Okay, so that's quite interesting. Thank you very much for that, Luke. There we go. I believe that Steve Hawthorne, patient as he has been, has decided that he can no longer be in the vicinity of Biffleshook Dam. <laughs> well, Tanya moved off in search of Columbus squirrel kill and um, she didn't return. We tried to go down to the waterhole to see if she went for a drink. We found the kudu, I thought it was a Nyala who called, but it was actually a kudu. But no sign of her. The Tlalamba also, they disappeared into the thickets there. And we thought, oh well, we've had a fantastic morning with them, have we not? Really, really cool to see them. And we got the, the end there with her up the tree, which is very, very special. Tlalamba with her little antics. I've seen her now running with a daker between her legs, running with a scrub hair, tripping over, and now moving a daker in the tree. So she's definitely getting better and honing her skills to become a successful adult. It's very, very nice to be able to witness this because when I started in January, she was just a little bundle of fluff. <laughs> bundle of joy, we called her. She's now just a very little mini version of Tandy with enormous ears. Very cute. Very, very cute, but I have no doubt they will still be there this afternoon. At least there's no. They have, haven't eaten too much of that dacre. There's still plenty of meat. You could see, I don't know if you were watching, but when Tlalamba moved it, she nearly dropped it because of the weight. There's still a fair amount of weight in there. Just seemingly a bit of the, the rump and the innards removed. Even though Tlalamba enjoyed eating a little bit of the ear, which I suppose 
one does from time to time. The ear really looked quite tasty, didn't it, Seb? Yes. Yeah. It made made Seb hungry. Okay, well, we're slowly making our way back to camp and uh, let's go see what other thoughts about breakfast McCurdy's got. I don't know. I haven't got a clue. I'm, what did everyone else guess, Kirsten? Kirsten is directing, just by the way, in case you're wondering who's on the car with me, no one. Just Ferg and I. I don't know what everybody else has actually guessed, if they've guessed anything at all. America, aka Alicia, aka Tori, aka when she's in South Africa, she's not Alicia Russo, she's Alicia Russo, is her name when she's here, because it changes because of our accents. Um, she says that there's eggs and flour that involve the breakfast, so obviously it's going to be flapjacks or pizza, not pizza, why did I say pizza? Pancakes, flapjacks or pancakes or something like that. Scones. No, we had scones the other day. Warthogs, and I wanted to see one. No, Warthog, come back. Sui! I don't know if that works. Can you even see it there? Sorry, it's hiding behind the trees. But there is a Warthog. Sui does not work to call the Warthogs in South Africa. Just by the way, if it's now t tried and tested. It's a very hungry auto is gobbling up all sorts of things. Oh, yeah, look, we can see it now. Hi, Piggy. It's like a ball. Doesn't look to be particularly old. Okay, bye, auto. Boring. <laughs> that was Ferg's joke. I just stole it. <laughs> that was all Ferg. But I said it, but thanks for, for the <laughs> joyful passing. He's not impressed with me now, he's now frowning. Going, how dare you steal my jokes, Taylor? Uh, community jokes. Community jokes. <laughs> so something else. Love, hope, faith. South Africans eat all the meals at any time of the day, whenever they want. There's no, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, one, one day in camp we had breakfast for dinner. We had pancakes and bacon and eggs. That was quite cool. That was Jerry's idea. Um, and then we've never done it again since. Thank goodness. Because, you know, when I arrive at dinner, I really don't feel like bacon and eggs. But anyways, um, what else do we do? Oh, we have all sorts of things. I mean, like, we have a brunch now. Sometimes it's very lunchy. Like, I'm really hoping that it's... I'm so sad that it's not going to be a pasta. I'm just, I mean, I have to make my own one when I'm on holiday. Um, I'm looking forward to that. But I, I cannot tell you how hungry, how hungry I am. I'm so hungry. I'm, I'm almost at hangry. Almost. Close. So luckily for all of you, this drive is going to end soon because you're oh my God, well, I'm hungry. I'm going to eat everything. All the things. I'm going to start grabbing mouthfuls of leaves and grass and sand. And all those things, probably not. No, I'm just going to wait. I'm going to run to the kitchen now, run inside, make myself, I'm going to treat, my, treat myself. I'm going to make Milo, which is like a hot chocolate type drink, but even better. And and then I'm going to get a rusk, a twice baked biscuit with the, these are muesli rusks. So they've got like granola in them, which are, oh, they're delicious. They're hard. They're great for dunking. I'm going to eat about six of those. <laughs> no, I'm not because I'm going to have one and then save space for breakfast. But I don't think I'll be able to make it through morning meeting if I don't have a rusk. Otherwise, I'm going to be very, very unpleasant. Now, there's a few of us in this camp who often get hangry, and I can vouch I've seen James hangry before. I'm not going to talk about that at the moment. This beautiful Nyala has decided to stand her ground. I suspect she spent a lot of time in the camp. We're not too far from camp. A whole herd of Impala has just run away from us and run away from her. And she's obviously looking at them thinking, they're really not so scary. Why are you running away? And I've spoken quite frequently about how the antelope just simply do not seem to habituate to us, with the notable exception of the Nyala and the Bushbuck that often live around camp. 
and they are very happy to be within sort of 10 or 20 meters of us which is just under 70 feet I mean that's pretty impressive let's just walk along here parallel with her we're not going to walk towards her as long as we don't behave like predators just keep talking normally in a normal voice don't hide behind a tree don't walk straight towards her we should get another great view from just over here also if Senzel should stop attaching himself to trees by his aerial that would be very helpful Siberia Zumi uh, no they don't actually they, they, they like to stick to the healthier options uh, they like blueberries and um, they do have a slight weakness for ice cream but pancakes no they don't like pancakes very much Taylor as far as I can tell has been talking about breakfast for the last half an hour She's obviously very hungry. There we are. There's no question that uh, I do get hangry. That is, that is true. I just get angry most of the time and blame it on hunger. Isn't she precious? What a beautiful antelope. I love little moments like this. It really does make you feel connected to the wild. To be allowed into an animal space like this is very, very special. You don't ever get this with, with impala, or zebra, or wildebeest, kudu, stienbok, dika. This, sometimes a cat will let you get this close and just watch you and stand with you. And I don't know if you were watching the little walk I did with Tandi the other day. That wasn't like that. She didn't react very well to us on foot because she just killed something. So we've all, all felt very bad afterwards. It's not what we want. So ideally, normally, you don't get into the animal space at all so that there isn't ever a potential for the animal to react negatively or positively. They don't react at all. But to be in a, the rare position like this where she knows we're here, she knows what we are, she's not afraid, she's not moving away. Well now she's very slowly moving away, but you can see she's not in the slightest bit panicked which means she's allowed us inside her flight zone <laughs> so you do sometimes have that experience with leopards especially young ones lions probably not so much cheetah yeah you can do it on foot with cheetah wild dogs also she let us very clearly within her flight zone which was very special indeed thank you Miss Nyala that was wonderful. That makes me feel happy now, even though we haven't found anything uh, in terms of Tingana. We found some other interesting things, I suppose. All right, well, I suppose it's time for me to bid you all a fond adieu, say that we will see you this afternoon for the 11th episode, I think, or maybe the 10th of Safari Lives. Uh, that will take a place at 1600 hours uh, Central African time. That's 4 o'clock Central African time. Thank you very much for driving the conversation today, sending us your questions and your comments. As always, you are the most important part of any live safari, and I say that in all seriousness. Bye-bye.